Tom, are you going to start or am I? I believe you should. Okay. I want to make sure. I'd like to ask the folks in the room if you'd uh, turn off your cell phone sounds, please. Appreciate it. Ready to go. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the April 10th, 2020 virtual emergency meeting of the Board of County Commissioners to discuss COVID-19. This meeting will be conducted via Zoom communications media technology as allowed under Executive Order 2069, issued by the Office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20th, 2020. Provisions have been made for any member of the public desiring to offer public comments to have access to the meeting in the Honorable Patricia M. Glass Chambers on the first floor of the County Administration Building at 112 Manatee Avenue West in downtown Bradenton. So I call this meeting to order. We're going to start with an invocation on this Good Friday, and the invocation will be given by Commissioner Reggie Bellamy. We thank you for giving us life, health, and strength. Dear Heavenly Father, we are in the midst of troubled times right now, and as our Creator, we ask you to come down upon us, dear Heavenly Father, and extend comfort to us and give us guidance in the things that need to be done today and strengthen us in the decisions that need to be made in reference to our public safety and the directions that we need to go. Lord, we know that there are individuals out there that are going through difficult moments. We ask you to strengthen them. We pray for our health care workers, individuals that's on the front line, dear Heavenly Father. We ask you to protect them and watch over them and their families and all the things that they are doing to keep the, co the community safe, dear Heavenly Father. But as this meeting go right now, we ask you again to guide us and strengthen us so we can make decisions what's best, but based on the way you would want us to make them. Lord, we ask you to give us the strength to help us help others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John now for the roll call. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is John Osborne, the guy waving at you right here on the screen. Um, I'm a Deputy County Administrator for Manatee County Government, and I'll serve as the moderator for the County Commissioner's emergency meeting today. Before I do roll call, I'd like to take a moment to provide some guidance on how we're going to be using Zoom Media technology for today's emergency board meeting. The Manatee County Board of County Commissioners and many staff in today's meeting are logged in remotely to maintain social distancing. We also have a few staff in the board chambers at the County Administration Building in downtown Bradenton. And to be clear, Commissioner Banak is the chair of today's meeting. I'll be taking direction from her. I'll be following Commissioner Banak's lead and assisting her to ensure that all the commissioners, the staff, and the public present in the board chambers get to provide comments today that are clearly heard. For the duration of the meeting today, the commissioners and other staff online will be online but with muted audio until they are recognized by the chair. And once recognized, I will unmute them for them to provide their comments clearly for the record. We are using closed captioning te technology today, so it's important that we speak clearly. We speak slowly, probably more slowly than normal. And the muting will help us provide a clear transcription for those speaking and minimizing overlapping conversation. And this is for the benefit of our hearing impaired residents. For our staff and board participating via Zoom, technology does sometimes take a moment, so please don't be uncomfortable with taking a pause after you're recognized to ensure that, for one, I, I get you unmuted, which I will endeavor to do as quickly as possible to help us provide a seamless uh, meeting as we can today. So commissioners and other staff, in order to be recognized by the chair today, please use the raised hand function in Zoom, and you will be recognized by the chair by the order you responded. And again, I will unmute you as quickly as I can after you've been recognized. So for today's roll call, I will be unmuting everyone, and we'll also roll call in uh, some other folks that are on the Zoom as well, our county staff, our clerk, and our speakers as well that are on Zoom. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody. And I'll begin the roll call. Commissioner Betsy Benack. Present. Com Commissioner Priscilla Trace. Here. Commissioner Reggie Bellamy. 
Here. Commissioner Stephen Johnson. Present. Commissioner Misty Serbia. Here. Commissioner Vanessa Boss. Here. Commissioner Kara Whitmore. Here. And from county staff, we have County Administrator Sherry Courier. I'm here. County Attorney Mitchell Palmer. Here. Chief Assistant County Attorney William Clegg. Here. From our clerk's office, we have Board Record Supervisor Vicki Tesmer. Here. And our two speakers, our Public Safety Director Jacob Sauer. Here. And Manatee County Sheriff Rick Wells. Here. Commissioner Banak, roll call is complete. I will go ahead and turn it back over to you, and I will get the folks back muted again. Okay. Thank you, John, for pulling this together. Um, now I'm going to turn it over for opening statements to our county administrator, Sherry Corrier. Thank you, Commissioner Banak. Just wanted to mention to all those, um, the Board of County Commissioners, as we indicated, we do have an audience here in the chambers, many of which have, have uh, signed up to speak, and I will coordinate along with both you as the chair and John as the moderator to make sure those individuals have an opportunity to speak. On behalf of Manatee County Government, we'd like to thank our residents for adhering to our local restrictions and the governor's executive orders. I want, we want people to know that we certainly don't take pleasure in having to take these types of orders, but that in an effort to try to help and assist our community come back from the current coronavirus and to help our law enforcement and our first responders and medical individuals, many of these issues that have been discussed at previous meetings were very important and instrumental in our progress. This afternoon, Public D Safety Director Jacob Sauer will provide the statistics that show that our measures are working to help stop the spread locally. For those watching at home, I'm just going to reiterate what Mr. Osborne mentioned. You may um, continue to watch from a distance. Today's meeting streamed live, as always, on www.mymanatee.org backslash MGA, and it can be seen live on Manatee Government Access MGA, Spectrum Channel 644, and Verizon Channel 30, as well as Comcast Channel 20. So we're here in the Honorable Pat Glass County Commission Chambers today, and we have provided space for those of you commissioners that cannot see. We are practicing social distancing here in the chambers, and all of the wonderful citizens that are here are um, eager and ready to hear our discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the chairman. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. So we're going to bring up the uh, first agenda item at this time. It's a discussion of ongoing issues relative to the coronavirus COVID-19 emergency. And um, I have on here uh, Mr. Palmer. Are you going to say something up front? Not at this time, Madam Chair. So that's what it says on my agenda. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over. I think, Jake, you are the first person to speak. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> good, good, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners, um, County Attorney Mr. Palmer, and uh, Madam Administrator Corrier. Uh, before speaking to, you, to, to the supplemental resolution that's before you today, I'd like to provide you with an update on the COVID-19 event, Manatee County's response efforts. Since the last update to you a week ago today, the virus has rapidly spread from 1.2 million to over 1.5 million cases being reported around the globe. U.S. death toll crossing 14,000 people Wednesday of this week with a record 1,858 deaths reported just on Tuesday alone. <clears throat> the state of Florida has over 17,531 total cases, 17,018 being Florida residents. Over 2,360 people within the state continue to be hospitalized, and sadly, the death toll across Florida has risen to 390. Manatee County has climbed to over 198 positive local resident cases and sadly 11 deaths. Although Hillsborough County has the most cases in the Tampa Bay area with 671 cases, specific areas of Pinellas, Manatee, and Polk counties top the chart when you break down the number of patients by zip code. If we look at the top 12 worst zip codes, Manatee County zip codes 34208, 34203, 34202 hold the first, 
6th and 12th positions, respectively. As you're aware, Mansi County stood up a drive through specimen collection site at the Bradenton Area Convention Center for a four-day period at the end of March, which has resulted in a 9% positive case count. The Emergency Operations Center remains at a level two virtual activation for select emergency support function personnel until further notice, with the majority of personnel working remotely and communicating through conference calls and video chat. As I've done during each of my other presentations related to COVID-19, <clears throat> Let me remind everyone of the five objectives that were established by the state of Florida that we continue to function under. One is stop the introduction of COVID-19 into our community. Two, protect the elderly and vulnerable population. Three, perform testing with a holistic approach. Four, encourage social distancing through multiple forms of messaging. And finally, prepare medical surge needs on the horizon. <clears throat> As they have since March 1st, Emergency management continues to partner with Department of Health every day while guiding the path to increase engagement and coordination of our community stakeholders, <clears throat> including our region partners. To date, we have sent over 150 mission requests by partner organizations to the state. And again, the ongoing medical supply limitations have the potential for leading to a destabilization of the health and medical lifeline. As I mentioned last Friday, we have begun to move forward with preparing for the medical surge on the horizon as alternate care sites are being evaluated. Hospitals have placed tents in their parking lots and the healthcare atmosphere in our community, community continues to change. These actions are all being taken to accommodate the surge in hospital needs and to find alternate locations for recovering patients to isolate for 14 days. Projections seem to agree, Florida will see a surge of patients and a peak of medical resources needs around April 21st. As I stated last Friday, our community is not immune to these numbers, nor is this pandemic under control. A projection put out that I have been following closely and which remains accurate, estimates that Mansi County could have over 432 positive cases and the state could have over 25,000 cases by April 15th. <clears throat> Locally, our first responders and healthcare workers are already feeling the effects of COVID-19. You have seen the news in the papers of healthcare workers having limited access to supplies to proper protectors while caring for these very sick patients. We are making further plans and continue to make changes to medical protocols as new guidelines are released. Screening all of healthcare workers and employees and rationing personal protective equipment as we receive small, incomplete shipments from state requests. Our EMS team continues to deal with a large influx of suspected positive patients. So all 911 calls are being treated as suspected COVID-19 patients at this time. This continues to take a toll on paramedics, EMTs, and first responders in many ways. First responders who come in contact with positive COVID-19 patients undergo various degrees of isolation, and this is putting a strain on EMS, fire departments, and local law enforcement daily to maintain adequate levels of staffing and to respond to 911 calls. At this rate, our healthcare system and our first responders will not be able to manage a, a surge of sick patients. Currently, we have six fire and 11 EMS personnel with different levels of exposure. Of those, eight are in self-isolation or, or are being quarantined. To date, there have been 14 fire and EMS personnel with the highest level of exposure, taking them out of the workforce. <clears throat> in speaking to the emergency resolution before you today, it is our recommendation that the resolution extend the temporary curfew from 11 p.m. to 5 p.m. each day. However, the Manatee County Policy Group did make a recommendation to remove the enforcement restriction on private property. I must caution everyone with the upcoming weekend, social distancing guidelines are still to be heeded. This year, however, even our observed holidays, uh, COVID-19 has re redefined how we connect with friends and family with the use of virtual techniques such as FaceTime or Zoom. I wish I could tell you that when we reach X number of this or Y number of that, we could simply lift the curfew. Unfortunately, there's no textbook to give guidance on that. As with everything else related to the COVID-19 event and our response efforts, it is always ever-changing, and we will literally take it day by day and week by week. We're here today asking to extend the curfew and to demonstrate why this curfew and resolution is working to help flatten the curve and continue to work towards saving many lives. Here's the data to quantify what we've seen since last Friday during the curfew hours. 
EMS has seen a 19.8% decrease in call volume. The Manson County Office has seen a 25.3% decrease in calls for service. Florida Highway Patrol saw a 90% reduction in the number of crashes along some of our busiest state roads. Our 911 call center has seen an average reduction in total calls over the past week with a 41% decrease in calls on Saturday night alone. That being said, the most significant takeaway from the ECC data that is that we have seen a 70% decrease in motor vehicle crashes needing EMS assistance since the curfew has gone into effect. Public Works Department has been tracking vehicular volumes at key locations throughout the county on a weekly basis for the past couple of weeks. The comparison demonstrates a dramatic decrease in vehicular volumes when comparing 2020 data to the same time in 2019. Depending on the location, vehicle volumes have decreased to a low or moderate level since the local state of emergency was issued on March 16th and have continued to decrease each day as we approach the governor's stay-at-home order on April 1st. Again, depending on the location, when vehicle volumes were compared during the curfew hours, Public Works Department has demonstrated that there was a 38 to 61 percent decrease on Saturday night alone, with the additional decreases of Sunday through Thursday that range from 11 to 61 percent decreases. Even though we've added measures to help slow the spread, it's important to remember through our through projections put out by the state as well as private research institutions, our community, our state, and our county will continue to feel the effects of COVID-19. Now is not the time to relax our personal efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19. Should this board adopt the policy group's recommendations today, Manatee County residents will have an even greater responsibility to practice personal protective measures, such as adhering to CDC guidelines of no more than 10 persons in a gathering who are also six feet apart from one another. Manatee County experienced an 83% increase in last week compared to the 70% statewide increase as of yesterday in speaking to COVID-19 positive patients. <clears throat> we also have a higher percentage of positive test results at 14.7% when compared to the state's 10%. Manatee County has 10.7 fewer new cases and is at a reduced risk of new cases per 100,000 residents than the state's rate of new cases, which is an indicator of an opportunity and should not be viewed as a success quite yet. However, over the past week, eight local residents have tragically died, bringing our total to 11 who have died from the complications of COVID-19. Over the past week, another 62 Manatee County residents have tested positive for COVID-19, bringing our total number of positives to 198. Manatee County's morta mortality ratio of cases by week increased to nine when compared to the state's at 2.5 mortality ratio per week. This means, as of now, nearly 6% of local cases will result in fatalities compared to 2% statewide. State data shows that the local risk of death is very high as compared to other areas of Florida. This could be attributed to our higher age demographic. Those at increased risk include the 70% of cases who are between 45 to 80 years of age, the 47% of cases that reside in 34202, 34203, and 34208 zip codes that I mentioned earlier, and a majority of cases are female, although risk of death is highest for males. Last week, we reported on several counties that had enacted similar temporary curfew hours. None of those have been lifted and remain in effect. Broward, Leon, Orange, and Osceola counties are from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Hillsborough, Liberty, and Miami-Dade counties are 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., and Gadsden County is from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. In conclusion, the COVID-19 virus has officially killed more Americans in five weeks than the H1N1 did in an entire year. The extension of the Supplemental Emergency Resolution adds support to the White House and Governor's Directive to slow the spread through April 30th and also helps our local law enforcement, the Department of Health, first responders, and the medical community protect our citizens in a more stringent way. Last week, we asked you to make a swift, purposeful decision to preserve our workforce protect our health care infrastructure, and protect our community. And thank you for that action. Today, we ask you to continue that commitment to our first responders and the public as you consider the recommendations of the policy group before you. Again, 
Thank you to the policy group and their continued efforts to work with our local leaders in coming to conclusions on our next steps, Manatee County, and our next steps. Manatee County ranks 14th in the state for all COVID-19 cases and has not yet achieved the flattening of the curve. Therefore, sustained efforts to promote low social distancing that reduce the spread or flatten the curve remain more crucial than ever. The next few weeks particularly will become the most challenging for the first responders, our healthcare providers, and the residents that we serve. Please consider these unique circumstances as you de debate the resolution uh, and curfew before you. Thank you. Thank you. I think now we're gonna hear from Sheriff Wells. Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Last week when we spoke, I, I told you then that we would follow the governor's order in regards to uh, stopping citizens throughout the county, and that would only be done if there was a legal justification to do so. It would not be done randomly. Randomly, Once again, that has not occurred. We have not issued any notice to appears, and we have arrested anyone for a violation of the curfew or the, the governor's executive order. Um, there. There was concern about the uh, no more than 10 on private property resolution. We were concerned about that, especially for this weekend, as families who have been quarantined for several weeks now uh, and, and feel strong that they have followed the, the practices and they want to be together. We, we, I did not feel that it would be um, uh, fair to them to say you have to stay inside and, and not be able to maintain uh, social distancing when we could spread them out if they did choose to, to come together. And we just didn't want them to be worrying about law enforcement coming to their home, uh, even though we have not and we will not. Uh, I wanted them to, to enjoy each other's company and holiday if, without fear of law enforcement. So that is one of the main reasons why you saw the policy group that or is why we are asking you to rescind that. I would tell you that we are following the governor's executive order. The, the governor's executive order is a stay at home order, not a stay at home if you want to order. Uh, if it's 2 p.m. or 2 a.m., the governor was clear that if you are not traveling to uh, essential services or essential activities, that you are to stay at home. Uh, and therefore, we will continue to follow not only the curfew, but the Regardless if you rescind the curfew or not, the governor's executive order is clear and nothing would change as far as how law enforcement approach those that violate the order. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sherry, um, I guess it's your turn. Just to wrap up a few things before we turn it back over to the board, just want to also mention um, Mr. Sauer talked about uh, uh, all of the statistical information that's provided and we want to reassure residents that if you do not have a personal care physician, uh, our Manatee County Rural, or excuse me, MCR Services has currently screened over 3,800 patients. They've um, tested over 266 patients. They have had about 24 positives, which runs along the same percentage as Mr. Sauer mentioned. And they have an available triage that is available by contacting them. Um, they have offices throughout the county and they've been assisting Department of Health and all of our hospitals as well. Um, also, as the sheriff mentioned and others, uh, to report a violation or a proposed violation, excuse me, a potential violation, of a curfew or the governor's executive orders. We will um, be mentioning these numbers again, but and they are posted on Manatee County's website, but the number for code enforcement for Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. is 748-2071. That's 748-2071. And the sheriff's office number for evenings and weekends is their main number. 747-3011, and that's extension 2260. 747-3011, extension 2260. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Mickey, do you want to go over the uh, changes to the resolution specifically at this time? Uh, Madam Chair, I can certainly do that. Um, 
you have before you today as part of your agenda materials, proposed resolution 20-056, which would serve to completely replace the resolution that you adopted a week ago, numbered 20-053. So the primary um, uh, modifications that we've made, you will recall that last week's resolution contained um, spe specific exemptions lettered A through H. That was in section two, lettered A through H. Uh, I won't recite all of those now, but examples were utility work, uh, food delivery services, uh, walking of domestic animals, commuting to and from places of employment. Again, items A through H. Uh, in today's iteration, all of those items A through H have been removed, uh, and it now simply reads, I'll quote uh, the entirety of paragraph two, a curfew is established, effective immediately, for all of Manatee County. All pedestrian and vehicular movement, standing and parking, except for persons engaged in essential services or essential activities, as those terms are defined in the Governor's Executive Order 20-91, are prohibited during curfew hours. Curfew hours during which such movement is prohibited shall be each day from 11 p.m. until 5 a.m. So the hours have not changed from the last resolution. But this go-round, we are focusing on essential services and essential activities uh, as defined by the governor in his executive order. So again, we've gotten rid of all of the various exceptions lettered A through H. <clears throat> uh, in section four of the latest iteration of the resolution, uh, we have eliminated any mention of public, pri uh, public pro excuse me, We've eliminated any mention of private property uh, and private residences, uh, such that uh, paragraph four now reads as follows. The prohibition set forth herein shall embrace all publicly owned property and all public spaces within Manatee County, including all municipalities within the county, excepting the town of Longboat Key. So again, all of the cities are captured by this language uh, and so this curfew will apply within each of the cities as well. So again, I stress that we have eliminated the language uh, that, uh, that referenced private property, and we are now focusing strictly on publicly owned property and public spaces. Um, we have added a new provision six uh, that focuses on homeless persons. I will quote that section. Uh, again, this is brand new in the resolution. As to persons who are homeless, law enforcement officers are directed to comply to the greatest extent practicable with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness found at, and it is, it is a very lengthy uh, website uh, recitation there, so I, I, won't, I won't read that, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, that, that is a document uh, that can be printed out from the CDC's website as referenced here uh, in this link, uh, and I would rather expect uh, that the Sheriff's Office would probably distribute a hard copy uh, of those guidelines to all of their road deputies. Um, <clears throat> so, so we are now dealing, uh, making a, a specific and concerted effort uh, to deal with homeless individuals in a different and, frankly, a more compassionate way. Um, Section 7 still recites that violation of the violations of the emergency resolution and the curfew uh, constitute a misdemeanor of the second degree, punishable as, as provided in Section 252.50 Florida statutes. Specifically, uh, that is uh, up to a $500 fine and or uh, up to 60 days in the county jail. Uh, but we've added some, some important clarifying language here, uh, and the sheriff was part and parcel of crafting this language. And so I will read it. <clears throat> should law enforcement officers observe any person violating this resolution, law enforcement should first seek to educate the person as to the requirements of this resolution and seek the person's voluntary compliance. Other enforcement options are to be utilized only as a last resort. So those are the modifications as compared with last week's version of the curfew resolution. All right. Um... At this point, I think we've covered it. Is there anything else that the uh, administrator or um, county attorney want to add before I go to questions? 
and uh, comments from the board members. No, thank you. Okay, um, now it's your time to see if we can work this question and answer thing properly. If you uh, want to ask a question or make a comment before we go to public comment, now is your time to raise your hand. Push that button that says raise your hand, right? Anyone? Questions? Commissioner, comments? We have Commissioner Servi, his hand is raised. Okay. Uh, don't see it on the on the board, but I'll go by the go away, raising your hand. Commissioner Servia, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, to begin with, I have a question for Jake. Um, Jake, I was contacted by a very sick resident who needs a COVID test, and he has a prescription from his physician, but he can't find a test. Can you recommend where he can go? Uh, MCR. Um, we're, we're recommending uh, and speaking to Dr. Bensey and, um, and the team that uh, MCR is the best place for someone that needs to get tested right now. Okay. Even if he does have a, a prescription from a physician. Yes, okay. Sir. That wasn't clear to me. Thank you. Um, I, I do have some questions for our attorney. Um, I just don't know if I should ask them now or after citizen comments. Do you, do you have a preference, Betsy, on how you're ordering the our comments? John, I'll ask you. Do, we, do you do you care? This is time for commissioner uh, questions and comments, so I think now is the proper time, right? Correct. And I have. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Well, first, I want to say thank you, Mickey, for the revised um, order. I, I think it's much better, and I, you know, I've I know that we have all seen the letter from the ACLU, and um, as as Mickey is the one who's taught me that there is never perfect legislation, so it's always good when you have you know a neutral body looking at restrictions, especially when there are important restrictions like this. Um, so I. I really do appreciate the revised ordinance. Um, Mickey, uh, during the last week, I have received a lot of input from the community, and I've tried my best to answer their questions. But I would like to ask you these questions um, in public so that everyone can understand them and so that I can understand them too. So first of all, Mickey, could you please explain your role as county attorney and who you represent? Um, yes, Commissioner, I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, my client is the Board of County Commissioners as a collegial body. I do not represent any one individual commissioner. Rather, I represent the Board of County Commissioners as a collegial body. My contract with the Board of County Commissioners prohibits me from dispensing legal advice to private citizens. Um, and so it, it, that, that is sometimes a frustration uh, for private citizens uh, who call up my office and seek legal guidance, but we are constrained to refer private citizens and private businesses uh, uh, to, to uh, consult with their own counsel, their own attorney of their choosing. Does that, does that answer the question Commissioner Servia? Yes, sir. Yes, it does, and I thank you for that. And, you know, I'm somebody who strongly believes in transparency in government, and I've heard from some in the community who have suggested that they may sue the county for violating the U.S. Constitution. So can you explain, Mickey, why, you know, you have made some decisions, but you're not willing to explain the basis for your legal advice and be completely, as, as people are calling, transparent to the public. And I want to also say that I, I believe maybe other states have other laws, because we have a lot of people in Florida who have lived elsewhere in the nation, and they have told me it just isn't right that you aren't fully, fully disclosing why you feel the way you do. Sure. Let me say also, before I reach your second series of questions, uh, Commissioner Servia, imagine, if you will, if I and my eight assistant attorneys were charged with dispensing public advice to the entirety of the, or, or, or legal advice to the entirety of the citizenry, uh, I dare say 
I would never sleep. I would never eat. Uh, that would be an impossible task for my office to undertake, uh, for us to dispense legal advice to any citizen within this county who desired it at no cost uh, and, and uh, you know, at the, at the uh, you know, at, at the hit of a sin button or at the, uh, at the dialing of a phone number. So it, it is a practical impossibility for my office to advise uh, uh, private citizens in their legal affairs. Um, and so, um, so your next question had to do with, um, uh, yeah, yes, it, 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 is, it is a fact that Several citizens have emailed in and uh, demanded to see the law that I rely upon in advising uh, my client. Um, and, uh, and, and these very same citizens have threatened to sue the county. Uh, so for me to turn over to a citizen all of the law that I would ultimately rely upon in defending this Board of County Commissioners in a courtroom would be akin to two private lawyers uh, litigating a case against one another. And one of the private lawyers calls the other one and says, you know, I'm feeling benevolent today. I'm going to share with you all of the arguments that I'm going to be advancing against you in court next week. That is absurd. That is absurd. Um, trust me when I tell you, commissioners, that my office has thoroughly researched the legalities of curfews enacted by local governments at times of emergency. We are very comfortable. And if any commissioner wants to individually see the case law on which I've, uh, I have relied, the, uh, uh, the statutes on which I have relied, I will be more than happy to share that with you. But I am not going to sit here and publicly announce all of the law that I would be relying upon uh, to a citizen who intends to sue me the following day, or rather to sue the Board of County Commissioners. I, I simply won't do that, and frankly, the law allows me, the law allows me to protect my research uh, from those who would sue the government. Uh, they need to hire their own lawyers and pursue their lawsuits. Uh, you know, defending the county is one of many things that we do. Uh, we're very adept in the courtroom, and so, uh, you know, we, we can do that. Um, so I hope, to, uh, again, uh, does that answer your question? I hope? Yes, sir, it does. Yes, and I thank you for that explanation. Um, you know, I've also heard a lot about um, the things that Manatee County is doing is in conflict with our U.S. Constitution. And I'm someone that upholds that document as one of the most important documents for our nation. So let me ask you some questions about the U.S. Constitution. In your opinion as an attorney, does it allow for police powers during an emergency? Uh, ab absolutely, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, the exercise of local police powers are absolutely allowed under both the uh, uh, United States and Florida constitutions. Florida local governments enjoy broad home rule authority the ability to enact local curfews in times of emergency is well entrenched in American law. And, okay, Mickey, also, you know, in reading the U.S. Constitution, does it give the state and local governments the authority to impose regulations to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens in an emergency? Because that's how I've always understood it. Absolutely. 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 The protection of the public health, safety, and welfare is the primary responsibility of a Board of County Commissioners. Okay. And Mickey, I'm sorry to keep asking all these questions, but I just want to make sure that I clearly understand them. Has the county implemented anything that's contrary to the U.S. Constitution? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, for me, if we're going to restrict any type of behavior, just for me, it's important that we limit the regulations to the greatest extent possible. So when I'm thinking about this curfew that we're all thinking about today, here's what I'm asking myself. You know, do the restrictions serve a genuine public health and safety matter? 
Okay, that's one of the questions. Is it the least restrictive way that we have available to protect the public's health while restricting people? You know, is it still justified? I'm so glad we're talking about this only seven days after we implemented the curfew because things are changing so quickly. I think we have to ask ourselves, is it still as important today as it was last week to implement a curfew? Because it should be, in my opinion, the shortest time period possible to protect the public's health. Um, I also have some questions about boat ramps. Can you tell me, Betsy, the appropriate time to ask those questions? I'm going to defer to the county attorney. Um, this resolution, um, the emergency resolution, does not include boat ramps. So since we're discussing the resolution, I don't believe this is the appropriate time. I think after we take a vote on the resolution, you can ask a question on boat ramps because that is not part of this resolution, but I'll ask for concurrence from our attorneys on that opinion. I would agree with that approach, Madam Chair. But I okay. know we're going to have discussions, so Ms. D, certainly you'll get an opportunity after action is taken on the resolution, or possibly so we, after, we the, okay. after the letter. Sorry? So, okay, we will discuss it, though, today, because I have yeah. serious concerns about the boat ramp. Yeah, okay, please. thank you. Then that's all I have on the curfew. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're all getting questions on that. Uh, Commissioner Bellamy, you're up next. Yes, I have um, a couple of questions. Um, first, I want to say thanks for the uh, revisions um, and, and removing the private property. That obviously was a concern. And um, I think as we looked at it, when some of the communication I received from constituents in my community, they were concerned about law enforcement um, having the ability uh, to go on their private property, I think it's very clear um, that we state that that has been removed. So I want to give thanks um, to that for, for removing that. I do have a couple of more questions um, just for clarity, but I want to make a plug um, about the homeless. Um, the county, we do have homeless efforts out there um, that we are looking into um, as far as putting up hygiene stations and things like that. And we're looking for a collaborating opportunity so we can make sure that we support the homeless in these times. Um, so if there's anyone in the community that has an idea to support, um, please feel free um, to, re to reach out to me. Question um, for a clear understanding from individuals um, from my community as far as why was Longboat Key um, exempted from the resolution? Can we please address that? Madam Chair, I think I can help um, answer that question. Uh, in the last policy group discussion that I personally was involved in, and one day runs into the next here lately, but it's been uh, one to two weeks ago, um, uh, the town manager from Longboat Key, Mr. Harmer, was on the line um, uh, as part of the policy group. and. Uh, uh, as 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 many as most folks know, uh, the town of Longboat Key is actually split roughly in half. The northern half is within Manatee County, and the southern half is within Sarasota County. And um, uh, and so, Mr. Harmer expressed a preference uh, in that policy group telephone conversation uh, to follow the lead of the Sarasota County Commission as opposed to the Manatee County Commission. And everyone on the uh, phone call said, we're perfectly fine with that. Uh, we, will, uh, you know, we will acknowledge that desire. And uh, that is the one and only reason why the town of Longboat Key is exempted from this curfew resolution. Um, and so if and when Sarasota imposes a resolution, uh, then I, I presume at that point, Mr. Harmer will come back to us and say, okay, we're now on board. Uh, uh, but, uh, but for now, uh, they've expressed to, uh, a desire to follow the lead of Sarasota County, and we have, and we have deferred to that. One additional thing I can share, um, commissioners, is um, during, a, during a state of emergency for our hurricane and our weather issues, 
The um, town of Longboat Key was, had asked us last year if they could take direction from just one county and not have to, to be sending messages of Manatee and Sarasota County out. And so in that instance of the weather emergencies, they do, and we granted them the approval to be working with Sarasota County. So I believe that's also the reason why they asked for this same uh, recognition. And, and just to clarify, because um, I was on that call too, he was very clear that the problem would be, and I don't remember him saying specifically whether he was for or against the curfew, to tell you the truth, but he did specifically say, I need to be exempt because we can't have half in a curfew and half out. I don't remember him saying, I vote with Sarasota. I, I don't recall that language at all, but he did say he did not want to be split, which certainly I could understand. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add, Mickey? Uh, Commissioner Benack, that, you know, that, yes, that is a very, very good point. Uh, if I was Mr. Harmer's counsel advising the town of Longboat Key, uh, I would probably pull out most of this gray hair, you know, attempting to distinguish between that half uh, of the town that's subject to a curfew and that half which is not. So that is a very good point. Mr. Bellamy, go ahead. Yes. Okay. And I, this week, I um, spoke to um, all three entities as far as law enforcement, um, the Carmel Police Department, Brayden Police Department, as well as the Sheriff's Office um, about enforcement. And the common communication is what um, there, there was. There have been no citations, and they're just seeking cooperation. And I think that's very, very important for our constituents to um, have a clear understand. Uh, we want to stress public safety measures without causing worries. This is a very difficult time and a high level of concerns um, for everyone. I need to ask a question to the sheriff about unique situations um, within the hours of the curfew. Um, if someone, uh, let's say, who had this isolated incident, someone had to leave and, and go and check on a parent between those times, I mean, how would that be dealt with if someone had an elderly parent um, that's living at home and took sick all of a sudden within those curfew hours. I think the community needs to know, you know, some of the steps and some of the things um, so they don't feel like they can't go. Yes, sir. Uh, this resolution makes it perfectly clear because this resolution follows the governor's executive order uh, and the uh, essential activity uh, checking on a loved one or a family member is allowed. It's very clear. And let me make this point. We've had a lot of questions, all of us, about this curfew. More people knew about the curfew than they, than they did about the governor's executive order. They had not read the executive order. They had not heard about it. They had no true understanding. Uh, so because of the questions that we have received about the curfew, we have been able to educate them on the higher executive order. But the, this resolution makes it clear that you can go anywhere you need to go at 3 o'clock in the morning if you're going to be checking on a loved one. That's it for now, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. Thank you. Um, I'm glad somebody brought, Reggie, I'm glad you brought up Longbow Key. Um, for many years, even when I was out there as an elected official in home speech, um, Lombo Key has always gone to Sarasota. Uh, they used to go to their EOC as long as I can remember during hurricane events. So, um, but I'm glad you brought that. We got an email just before we started the email, uh, the meeting, so I let the uh, citizen know. MCR Health that you're talking about, uh, I actually had a patient in Anna Maria that had, uh, could, he was a VA, couldn't get up there, temperature, everything uh, consistent, and I sent him there. They have a screening tent when you first go there. They'll take your temperature, ask you questions, and he actually met that. He went back, had to get oxygen, his oxygen level, and he was only in his 40s, uh, very low. They gave him oxygen. They sent him home to quarantine. He's doing better, but they did do a test. So the prescription um, is, uh, I'm sure they're going to accept it, and they got it like eight or nine sites, so just call there. There is a hard time getting through. I ho I'm hoping that Patrick... Carnegie or Dr. Colgate is on this line now because uh, this person was having trouble getting through, so he just went there as a walk-in. 
Misty, you said your person's pretty sick. They do have to go there, though. So, um, you know, try to get somebody. And the homeless, uh, I know Sherry has sent us something, and we've talked about it a few times this week. We need to get something out there for the public where they can have access to that. You know, there, our website, if we could put that on, you know, Bay News 9, uh, a, a banner or something. I know on our webpage, we always say go to our webpage if we can make it easy. Just some various places, uh, handouts at turning points, et cetera, at the churches, because uh, we're going to see more of this, and we have a lot of people asking us for um, things to re relate to this, and we just have to be have a coordinated, communicated effort. So that's all I have for now. Okay. Um, that's the last person I have signed up to make a comment. So at this time, I think we're going to go to public comments. Um, so I'll defer to John how you're going to do that. I'll defer to uh, Sherry Corrier down in the chamber so okay. you can make the call for folks to come up, Sherry. I will. Uh, commissioners, uh, currently in the chambers, we have 11 citizens signed up to speak. Um, we have them in order. And what I'd like to mention to the citizens, I'm going to call the first three names. You'll notice leading up to the podium, there are there is tape in blue lines that is uh, social distancing approved, separated. If I could get the first three names to stand up and then we'll call the remaining ones. Um, I have their names and uh, Ms. Tesmer, do I need to do anything or would you like to ask them to um, state their name at the podium after I call them up? Stating their name clearly would be fine. Thank you. Okay, first to speak, we have Betty Sales Rhodes. If you could come to the podium, right behind her on the first blue line, I have Andra Griffin. If you could come to that blue line, and right behind Ms. Griffin, I have Kevin Wright. Those are our first three speakers. Okay. You can just state your name when you get to the podium. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Betty Sales Rose, and I'm here because last week I heard the whole event that you all was talking about. And my main concern was this, was when you all voted as county commission on this private property, if someone want to be outside their house to smoke a cigarette, cigarette at 11 o'clock, they should be able to do it. And what I, what I did, I always make sure when I hear somebody make a statement, I always make sure I call to see if this is true. And I did call the Tallahassee because I want to know the rights of us as citizens with our rights. And you all did violate our rights for putting that order in, but I'm glad Sheriff Webb said or you all say that is taken out now. And I'm satisfied for that because on private property, you shouldn't even have private calls to come with it without any kind of action. And another thing, we as people, we do have the right, according to the Declaration. We have rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And you all sometimes, as county commissioners, be stepping overboard, doing what y'all want to do to citizens here in Manatee County. Now, I know for a fact, and it's funny because I was a little scared of this coronavirus too. And I stayed in because I'm going to go 11 to 5. Like we all say, we're going to stay in. We're going to do what is right to protect ourselves. But it was so funny, like you talk on the phone, I guess. I don't know why some people didn't hear about it because I got mad myself. And I had to call different people when it came on my page about a party here, I guess, on 12th. And I got very upset behind it because they shouldn't have had it there. But we did make one statement. It was true. Out of all the police department, we believe bring the police department was going to be the best, the one to go and mess with the people, and that did happen. They did, you know. We say we guarantee before anybody stop anybody, it's going to be bring the police department. And all us laugh about that. And that's one thing. We as law enforcement, you should know the rights of the people. But I didn't get mad because they was there because they shouldn't have been there anyway with all those people there. But I'm just saying, we got to realize that you got to treat people as you want yourself to be treated. Now, everyone who's on this board was 
young and wasn't sitting on that board. And you all all had something to say if it wasn't right for yourself. So you all need to go back and think, do you want this to happen to you? Where everything is violated. And another thing, Governor DeSantis say a 30-day order. He didn't say the other thing that you all say. So I think you all should get yourself together. But I am glad that you all did take that out of private property because I don't smoke. But if I want to go out the door and sit in my yard because it's cool outside, I should have that privilege. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, next up is uh, Andrea Griffin. Thank you. State your name and everyone, you have three minutes to speak. My name is Andrea Griffin. Manatee County is my home and therefore I protect my home. Uh, last week, five of you chose to violate our rights by unconstitutionally broadening police power. Attorney Palmer improperly advised laws and amendments, therefore committing malpractice on this county. Attorney Palmer, five commissioners, and the sheriff opened our county up to lawsuits. You should all be fired and removed, but we cannot do that until election time, and believe me, we will remember. My government has no right to make decisions for me and my family. Shame on you, Betsy, for stating that you don't care about our uh, violating our rights. Well, guess what? I care, and many people in this county care. Our Constitution doesn't say if you have a medical emergency, you can violate our constitutional, civil, or property rights. Our constitutional rights are our God-given American uh, rights as to be an American citizen. It provides protection to the people against government overreach, which you have clearly done, and shame on you. Let's talk about facts. We were told first responders are exhausted and they need to take time to take this much needed break. Let's explore this a little more. So I had an opportunity to drive by the sheriff's offices, the EMT stations, the fire stations, and the hospitals. None are overwhelmed. In fact, doctors and nurses are being furloughed. Let's talk about the sheriff's office. On, uh, on April 7th, we have officers rounding up cattle on US 41 in Palmetto. Yesterday, I observed two officers sitting in their vehicle on 5th Street East, two officers chatting, laughing, and seemingly no problem in the world. Then I turned the corner, and there's yet another officer in the Wells Fargo parking lot. So we have three officers sitting on their duffs while they're screaming they're overwhelmed. I am sick of the lies. So again, how does this curfew give our first responders their much-needed break? I have photos of all the traffic on the roads and in the stores. Please explain to me how nightly curfews will slow the spread when everyone is moving around during the day. According to the CDC, we had over 2.8 million Americans die last year of heart attacks, strokes, and 61,000 from the flu. You probably want to tell me that you can't catch a heart attack. According to WHO, 17 million people die a year from infectious diseases which have no treatments, cures, or vaccines. We were told millions of people would die from this virus, and now it's tens of thousands because their models and assumptions were wrong. I will not ask permission to go out of my house. I will not have papers to drive my car. I am an American citizen. We are not a third world country ran by dictators, though it's getting hard to tell with our county commissioners. I will not stay silent, locked away in my home. This is America. Each of you should be ashamed of yourself. Thank you, Steve and Vanessa, for doing the ethical thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Mr. Kevin Wright. Directly behind Mr. Wright is George Cruz, and behind Mr. Cruz is Matt Bauer. I'm Kevin Wright, citizen of Manatee County. I'm wrapping up a week one of an online university professor in an American government and politics course, being here and engaged in citizen efforts to protect and preserve our civil liberties complements my paying job. But I'm not here, as suggested by some commissioners, because I have nothing better to do. I try to mentor my students on how to think, not what to think. I have faith that in so doing, I can fulfill my contracted goal that each gains an appreciation for the United States Constitution and our founding principles. The citizens of Manatee County wish to do the same for our employees, meaning our county commissioners. I only came to fully understand the axiom that all politics is local a few years ago. You have the greatest everyday impact on citizens' lives, and yet citizens are the most ignorant and least engaged compared to those that get the most media attention. County commissions are uniquely situated in American lives amongst mo most other bodies of governance. You have both legislative and executive powers. The weight of that ought to guide your every action in every matter. 
uh, particularly one with the gravity of the resolution passed last Friday and the one which you're considering today. Five of you have come up short in this regard. I'm not oblivious to the stress that does and ought to lie on the shoulders of this board. The Constitution was not designed to make government's job easier. To the contrary, it was designed to make it more difficult while empowering a government by, for, and of the people, the folks for whom you work. The ease with which you implemented a decision prevented you from giving due consideration to how difficult it should have been to arrive at that decision. One citizen told me that she did not feel that her rights were violated by the resolution. She's contrary to all seven commissioners who clearly admitted, you betcha, rights are being violated. But she missed a more important point. Choosing not to exercise a right does not mean that that right does not exist. Violation by government is only known in the attempt to exercise it. If every one of the more than a quarter million Manatee residents, residents agreed with her, the assertion that our rights as individuals are being violated would still hold true. I read Mr. Bruce Stam's request for information for the basis of the resolution passed last Friday very carefully. It is abundantly clear that while there may be a political risk in answering his repeated request, there is no legal risk. We the citizens hired you to put your big boy and girl pants on every day and to take political risk, not to shield yourselves behind your unelected legal advisor. As for Mr. Palmer, I remain convinced that he did not do due diligence in providing counsel to you. He did not adequately access either the governor's executive orders or the United States Constitution, nor does it appear that he solicited the advice and counsel of peers similarly situated. Uh, what does the state attorney, Ed Brosky, have to say about this? We don't know. Mr. Palmer, clearly from what he said, is not a constitutional lawyer. I'm not an expert on the Constitution, but I know enough about it to know that he made clear. You cannot equate common law with constitutional law. It's not the same. With regard to the curfew, House guests of any number, large or small, that may come to my home, they're captives there until assembly after 11 p.m. Otherwise, they're subject to being stopped on their way home and charged with a misdemeanor and the attendant penalties. Longbow Key, Longbow Key, it has Manatee County residents there. Limit. You have made a conscious it's decision not to have equal application of the law for the citizens of Manatee County. Where is the red line? Why have a curfew have at all if you're going to run entirely to Mr. Wright, this Mr. decision? Wright. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have George Cruz. After that, directly Matt Bauer. And I believe Dr. Scott Cud. Clulo, if you please um, stand up and stand on those blue pieces of tape. Thank you. We good? Yes, sir. All right. Madam Chair, Commissioners, good seeing all of you in your little boxes there. Uh, last Wednesday, our Governor Ron DeSantis passed a stay at home for the entire state of Florida. And as an aside, because it came up earlier in this meeting, uh, stating all of these statistics over this past week about the improvements in Manatee County while a state-initiated stay-at-home started simultaneously with our curfew is at best disingenuous to use any of those statistics to justify continuing with this curfew. But I'll digress. That wasn't part of what I was going to say. Anyway, after the stay-at-home was initiated, Manatee County elected to take one step further and initiate our curfew. Now, I question why we do this because we've got a Republican governor and He's looking out for our best interest, and at the very least, six out of the seven of you at least run as Republicans. So I would think you would give our Republican governor the benefit of the doubt that he knows what's best for us. But I'm not going to go into the legality of this. I'm not going to go into the constitutionality of this. There's enough other people here to speak to that. I'm going to speak as a citizen. I'm going to speak as somebody who has been afforded the opportunity to talk to a lot of people in these past few days, whether it be through social email, phone calls, and in a few cases in person, to see what they feel about this curfew and why they feel we have it. And we can't come to a consensus on why we have this curfew in place. And we can't really get a straight answer. And the only real answer we've sort of gotten, and believe me, I'm not, not going to repeat this quote, and it's not directly related to the quote, but it's the, the context of it, is this was put in place to scare us. It was put in place for fear. It was an opportunity to tell us that if we don't follow the orders of Governor DeSantis, then there is a chance that even more stringent requirements and restrictions are gonna be placed upon us. But 
from talking to people, let me tell you something. People of Manatee County, the citizens of Manatee County, are capped out with fear. There's fear that we're going to lose our job. They're scared that they're not going to have their company back when this comes out. There is fear that their kids are being left behind in school. How are they going to pay their rent? How are they going to put food on the table? We have more fear than we know what to do with. We don't need our elected officials to add another layer of that onto our lives. So what I'm going to recommend to you here and plead with you is get rid of this curfew, get rid of the fear that's overlaying us, and instead govern through hope. Govern through the hope that if we all stay home, our favorite restaurant will open faster. Our bars will open, we can all go out with our friends. The hope that our kids can go back to school sooner, that they can go on the soccer fields, the baseball fields, the hockey rink, and we can get on with our lives. That's what we need. That's what we need from our elected officials, the people that we chose to put up here on the dais to represent us and to protect us. So I'll just finish real quick, because I know the light went off, that at the end of the day, people are gonna remember what we all do here. And really the choice is yours. You can either govern from above through fear or lead side by side through hope. Thank you. Thank you. We have Matt Bauer up next, Dr. Scott, Scott Clulo, and just after the doctor, we have James Alderman. Good afternoon, board. It's kind of weird not looking at anybody except on the screen. Um, I'm going to not talk about legalities uh, as well, uh, just like George did. What I want to talk about is practicality. Um, so I think a really good question would be, why haven't we asked the state attorney about how this all unfolds for him should the sheriff or somebody have to arrest somebody for violating the court curfew? Um, that question hasn't been weighed in. And I'm curious to see how that would unfold. Um, I'd love to also hear the sheriff tell the board of what protocols, uh, how it looks different based off of whether the curfew is in place or he's following the guidelines for the governor. What's the difference between the two? other than the potentially the curfew is raising awareness and scaring the bejeebus out of everybody, which I think you've pretty much done. Um, so I'd love to hear from the sheriff again, what's the difference between the two and what actions will he, is he taking differently based off the curfew that he wouldn't have been doing just off of the governor's order? Um, I think that's just really important. It goes to why we even need this curfew in the first place. Um, I'm on board with what George said as well. Um, we need, we need leaders, leadership, leadership of the hope that just George just talked about, not leadership from fear, um, genuine leadership. It'll be a courageous thing for you folks here today, uh, commissioners, to change your mind and do what I think is right um, and actually get people on board and do what is right for all of us at the same time. Um, I'm not going to be able to stick around for the whole meeting, but I do want to speak briefly on the boat ramps. Um, I was one of the proponents uh, that Misty had heard from. Uh, reached out from a lot of people reached out to me from the fishing community um, a lot of people obviously upset the governor has mandated essential activities boating is one of them fishing is one of them I am fortunate I have a boat lift in my backyard I don't have to worry about a boat ramp but other people first responders fire firemen policemen everybody on the front lines and everyday citizens unfortunately they don't necessarily have that ability to do so there's a way for us to open up the boat ramp so people can do those things in a responsible way. And I would say this is such a big thing that as you're patrol patrolling the sandbars and so forth where the biggest issue was created in the first place to shut down the boat ramps, no warnings are nece necessary. Immediately issue a, you know, a fine or a citation for people violating the order. That's really that quite simple. But I think what you're going to find is a lot of the boaters are going to be respectful of the situation. You're going to find the fishermen and the boating community policing themselves, and you're not going to have an issue. So I would ask that the board very seriously consider, please, reopening the boat ramps so people can enjoy those, and we can figure out a way to do that in a responsible way and, and so forth. So that's all I have for you guys today, and uh, I think you know where I stand with everything. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Scott Clulo is up next, James Alderman behind him, and Joseph, I believe it's Hader, H-A-I-D-E-R. Is that correct? Thank you. Dear commissioners, thank you for having us. My name is Dr. Scott Clulo. I'm representing the Manatee County Medical Society in support of the curfew and would just like to read a letter that was drafted by our board. Dear commissioners, we are very concerned with the health and well-being of our 
local population and healthcare providers in regards to the rapidly spreading coronavirus infection. As such, the Manatee County Medical Society applauds your decision to enact a curfew in the Manatee County to further protect its citizens above and beyond the governor's most recent order. We know that this was a difficult decision and took courage to do so, even with the opposition of some citizens concerned with violation of their civil rights. The COVID-19 crisis is a public health emergency that surpasses the norm. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected more than a million people worldwide and has caused significant morbidity, mortality, and economic disarray. As you are very aware, Manatee County is home to more than 400,000 residents. Our community's median age is 49 years. However, 27% of our residents are older than 65. We have 13 nursing homes and approximately 1,500 residents, and three of them currently have residents diagnosed with COVID-19 virus admitted to our local hospitals. There is a significant proportion of our population in the high-risk group that could seriously be affected by this virus. We have, re we have reviewed the details and analyzed several different models of the COVID-19 infection progression in communities in the United States and around the globe. Although painful, the measures to slow the spread undertaken by you and our, our county and state uh, leaders, such as closing schools, beaches, government businesses, and public facilities, were wise in surely saving lives by slowing down the infection transmission. Taking into consideration our population with the current model of social restriction in our county, it is possible to have excess of 4,000 people infected. Approximately 15% of those people could require hospitalization, up to 5% becoming critically ill with an estimated 25% mortality, or 2.5% mortality rate in people older than 65. These numbers are abysmal, and according to the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, the Florida peak date has been moved up to April 21st. The capacity of our community to take care of these cases can be easily overtaken if we do not continue to have immediate bold measures to flatten this curve. Although we hope that this will not happen in our community, it is better to be prepared than to delay action and become unable to manage a potential large number of patients needing medical assistance. After extensive deliberation and review of the clinical data and looking at different models of the disease spread, the Manatee County Medical Society Board of Governors is extremely concerned for the potential risk of our community. For this reason, we have based literature review make the following recommendations. In addition to the brave decision to impose a local curfew, social distancing, and following safe at-home protocols, we request the Board of Commission make a recommendation at Friday's meeting to encourage all Manatee County citizens and visitors to wear masks, not N95 masks, regular masks, when out in public, especially when commercial transactions. The CDC has suggested this voluntary use of face masks, and we ask the Commission to support that request of our citizens wearing those recommendations. The Medical, Soci Medical Society Board of Governors is working with other local health care professionals to protect our citizens and treat patients, and we appreciate your consideration regarding more stringent restrictions in dealing with this infection. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. James Alderman. After that, Joseph Hader. And if you'll come up, uh, Gene Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, fellow commissioners. Um, my name is James Alderman, and I'm here basically to just propose some common sense in the closure of the boat ramp issue. Um, I appreciate you guys caring for everybody's health. I know it's a, a burden that you guys feel. Um, however, I just plead that you would um, start using some common sense on things like issues like the boat ramp. Um, I and many other boaters have not been able to understand the logic behind closing the boat ramp. Um, according to tax collector records, we have just shy of 20,000 boats that are registered in Manatee County. Um, in Manatee County, according to the property appraiser, we have about 20 or uh, 12,500 waterfront properties. So probably I would guess about 30% of those would have their own vessel. So this boat ramp closure doesn't affect them a bit. Uh, you've probably got about 1,000 boats in this county that are at public private facilities. So that's another group of people that this does not affect. So if you start deducting all those, you've got probably about 13,000 people in this county that are affected by this boat closure. Um, I and myself some have some reasons 
to want to use the boat ramps. Um, I have a close family member that's got a disability, and just getting out on the boat is extremely good therapy for her, especially during this time of crisis when everything is so confusing. Um, so looking at all the figures, this whole rule came about because of approximately 100, 150 people not doing what they're supposed to do, yet 13,000 people are being affected. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, and how many of those people that the 100 that did it are actually being affected? We don't know. There's no way you would know. Um, so my closing is think about who it's affecting, what your goal is, what it's actually accomplishing. Thank you for your time on that. Also, I would like to know, um, I would like them to add address as to whether the April 15th is still projected as far as things being opened back up, restaurants and so forth. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Joseph Hader, then after Mr. Hader, Gene Brown, after Mr. Brown, Rodney Jones. Hi, my name is Joseph Heider. I'm a third year resident at Manatee Memorial Hospital, resident physician. Um, first of all, all the nurses and the healthcare workers, especially those in the COVID unit at Manatee Memorial, want to appreciate and thank them for everything they're doing. Um, so why? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness all begins with life. There can be no happiness, there can be no liberty without life. Why? We have to take measures and we have to act now because flattening the curve doesn't mean we're not all going to get sick. We all may be asymptomatic carriers for all we know. That's why I'm wearing this mask to protect you, not me. Flattening the curve means we're not overrun in the hospitals which are already short on ventilators. Flattening the curve means we slow down that rate so people aren't, the hospitals aren't overrun and I'm not making decisions, or other people on accounts are not making decisions, whether you, me, or someone else in this county gets a ventilator or not a ventilator. We don't have to choose life and treatment for somebody else. That's the why that these measures are so important in ensuring. I just got off of two weeks at the hospital straight. Today's my second day off where I worked 84 hours each week. And I can tell you that everybody is tired, but what keeps us going is that we're all on team humanity. I don't know what people see when they drive past the hospital or whatnot, but I'll tell you that those nurses in that COVID unit dressing up with a pound of PPE, hot, wearing not just this mask, but an N95 and breathing that in, sweating and taking care of your family members, your neighbors, your patients, four to six hours at a time before being allowed to use the bathroom or have a drink of water, that's physically taxing. They are exhausted. Everybody is exhausted. And if they do break to laugh once in a while, we're all human. We all have need a laugh every now and then to keep our humanity. The message here is simple. I think Republican, Democrat, anything in between is out the door. We all belong to humanity at this point. Flattening that curve, again, is not about us not getting sick. It is about ensuring that we do not have to be overrun, that we do not have to make decisions that we are uncomfortable making. It's about ensuring that we give everybody the chance to have the pursuit of life. Therefore, on another date, pursuing their liberty and coming home and being happy with their families. I want to thank everybody for this time. I want to thank the council. I know it's not easy making a decision. There are no right answers. As you said, there's no legislation that's perfect, but that's understandable. We're all here to work together, and that's something we got to keep doing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Heater. Gene Brown. Rodney Jones. After Mr. Jones is Ruth Lyerly, and after Ms. Lyerly, uh, Silvio... Uh, I believe he had to leave. I'll, I'll go back and double check that. Mr. Jones? Uh, greetings. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak and just amazed to see 
so many people go over to three minutes and not get arrested. Uh, customarily, when I come to the uh, chambers and I go over to three minutes as a black male complaining about racial injustice and corruption in our elected body, I'm arrested. So I appreciate you for testing the limits today and going over that time frame. Um, I think I have to, I think the Constitution means different things to different people. I think it's a uh, document that is built for all of our protections, but me as a, a black American, I see things different. We've had 400 years of uh, what by the United States data and even here local data, um, it leads to something is wrong uh, with the interpretation of that constitution. So when we hear um, that there's going to be curfews, uh, law enforcement, it's going to be allowed to come on private property, it's concerning to us. It is concerning to us because of the data that is presented by Manatee County and our local municipalities that clearly show without a doubt that there's racial bias here. I am not a racist. I was not raised to be a racist. I wish I could wake up one day and not see color, but I'm a realist. Until data shows different, until the data that we receive from Manatee County Law Enforcement, Manatee County Sheriff's Department, the Bradenton Police Department, and others will think differently. Until we have real conversations about race here and what that means and re what restrictions means to populations such as mine, just like the coronavirus is now showing that blacks, once again, are tremendous, tremendously overrepresented by our socioeconomics and the conditions that we've had to endure that have put us in those positions here in this country. That is a research proven fact. The fact here that black people make up 9% of the population here in the Manatee County but we constitute 25% uh, of the arrest. Um, in the city of Bradenton, blacks make up 70% of those killed by Bradenton P Police um, Department law enforcement. 70% of the people killed in the city of Bradenton are black by law enforcement. You, we present that to our mayor after numerous efforts. Mayor Wayne posted, and you know what he said? He, last election, he said it was a political stunt. It was a political stunt. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that uh, I'm, I'm not in support of the curfew unless uh, there's some medical evidence that shows that the, the coronavirus is more active after 11 o'clock, which it has not been presented. Uh, uh, unless it is, somebody needs to show it to me. I haven't seen it. I mean, I think it's an overreach. Uh, I support anyone that stands for their rights and stands for their property rights and stands up for the people. And the sad thing above it all, and I'm certainly got, not going to make sure I go over the three minutes if I can help it, uh, but one thing that we are concerned about is our elected body. We have to really, as a people, whether you're black, white, green, or purple, you have to really start looking at our elected body because it, it appears like our elected body uh, serves themselves in big, in big interests more so than the people. And so I'm, I'm glad to see the changes. I'm glad to hear that, oh, I will go over slightly. I'm glad to hear that uh, our county commissioner, Reggie Bellamy, because last week he said that he didn't debate on civil liberties or civil, civil rights as a black man. That was disgusting and we're repulsed by it. And just like these folks said, they won't forget. Brother, we're not going to forget either. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You. Um, up next, Ruth Lyerly. After Ms. Lyerly is Silvio, um, I believe Mr. Tanny. Had to leave? Yes, he had to leave. And after that is uh, Dr. Marcialis. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm here uh, in response to the closing of the boat ramps as well. I know others have spoken about it. Um, this was not mandated by the governor. In fact, it was mandated by seven representatives of our county. Um, the governor encouraged boating, fishing, running as an essential activity. We have a vast body of water in which to fish and boat safely. In my opinion, you have disrupted the livelihood of many of our citizens. The majority of charter, charter boat captains do not fall within the small business category because they are usually a one man or one woman operation and therefore do not qualify for the small business loans now being offered. So you have disrupted their livelihood to what end and for what reason? I feel this decision was unwarranted and not well thought through. Most boats do not carry more than eight people. So help me understand, and I expect an explanation. Understand why those with private docks are allowed to launch their boats. I'm not opposed to private docks launching their boats. People should enjoy this activity, but you've not only affected people's activities as well as affecting livelihoods. As we see our farming industry devastated 
due to school, restaurant, and theme park closures. Any industry in our county that can be saved should be, and this is one of them. Finally, when a county commissioner is on record saying, yes, we are trampling on citizens' rights and scaring people, it becomes very concerning to all of us. It is not your job, nor it is, nor it is not in the Constitution, that you should trample on rights or scare citizens. To what end? Where do we draw the line? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Marcialis. Thank you, County Commissioners. Um, I, uh, I'm going to start saying I, I am the uh, Program Director of the Internal Medicine Department at Manatee Memorial Hospital. I'm one of the doctors in charge of the COVID units and uh, primary going to be in the COVID units with patients that uh, are affected by this disease. As we all know, this is, a, this is not the flu. This is a very transmissible virus which has shown deadly consequences, in, especially in the population that we serve in Manatee County. Our role as primary care providers is to give guidance to the county commissioners about what the proper measures that will preserve the health of the population of this county should be taken. Um, I uh, really appreciate that you guys listen, all of you county commissioners. Most of you have listened and, and vote in favor of some common sense restrictions that were shown in other models to be the best way to prevent the spread of the disease. As my colleague, and who I'm uh, very proud to be one of my residents, uh, very eloquently uh, expressed that flattening the curve doesn't mean that this disease is going away. What it means is that if we can spread the disease over a long period of time, we're not going to have the surge in which they are going to have more people than needing beds that we have in Manatee County. And at that point, the healthcare professionals will need to take very uh, difficult decisions to see who is going to get the vent or who is not. The curfew is one of the measures that will improve these uh, number games in terms of exposure. It will also, uh, I, I, I am happy to see the 19% the decrease on visits by the, um, by, uh, by the um, CMS. And, uh, and uh, that is um, something that is very important for us as we are struggling to meet the demands of, um, of the community. We have already sick healthcare providers or they have sick family members and we are running kind of a skeleton crew and we are trying to preserve human uh, preservation is very important. So we cannot expose all the physicians at one time and get all the physicians sick. We cannot expose all the nurses at one time, get all the nurses sick. And then who's going to take care of all of us? So um, I am in favor of your decision. I'm going to take a little bit more time, sorry. I'm in favor of your decision and I strongly support from my personal standpoint and from all the doctors in the Manatee County community, all the efforts that you have taken. I believe that there's no effort enough that we can do to preserve human life. And I believe that uh, we actually should encourage not only that, but improve sanitation in essential business. I think that is an important part that we need to also look at and really define what are not essential business and really take a really hard look at this. Um, I am not an expert on that. I am here to try to protect the health of all our community. I listen to the points that um, <clears throat> other people have made in terms of uh, civil liberties and, and infringement of the rights. I just think, what about the right of that person that gets sick because of not following proper uh, distance. Can we do something to prevent that? 
what are the rights? You know, your right as county commissioners is to protect the health of the citizens in this county. And for that, you need to listen to the experts. And I think that the Thank experts you. are the healthcare community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the last person we had signed up, I've got corrected, who has left is, was Dr. Silvio Tani. He is a president of the Medical Society, and he wanted to uh, speak on behalf of the letter that was sent. Does anyone else that's in the um, room that has not signed up wish to speak at this time? Could you step to the podium, please? State your name at the podium. Anyone else? Commissioner Benack, we have one more person stepping forward. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break after public comment, just so everybody knows. I guess we all just walk away from our computers, right? I'm not going to mm -hmm. shut it down. Right. So be cognizant. Hopefully put us all on mute during the five-minute break. I will, Commissioner. Hi. Can you guys see me? I'm pretty short. All right. My name is Juliana Dale. I am one of the physicians at Manatee Memorial Hospital. I'm also in clinic um, with Dr. Michaels, serving about 2,500 people in clinic. And currently, we have about 12 patients who are quarantining at home, and we have 24 patients in the hospital, um, half of them being on ventilators. When I was in the hospital a week ago, um, we had, two weeks ago, sorry, we had four patients. So I wanted just to give those statistics so that you guys see that um, this disease is spreading quicker than we thought it would be, and that's why our peak is now April 21st. Um, with that said, I just wanted to speak with experience um, and from the heart of we, I've seen so many nurses that are going way beyond their limits to be taking care of these patients. Um, I've seen nurses who have not seen their families. I've seen, um, I've seen them in tears at the hospital, just being overwhelmed right now. And we're not even at our full capacity yet. Um, so really the point of this curfew is not to limit people's rights. It's not to um, harm them. It's really to protect our citizens. Um, and of course, you should be able to check on your parents or go out onto your porch to smoke a cigarette. No one's telling you to not do so. It's just more of getting traffic um, off the road from 11 to 5. Um, you know, I, auto insurance statistics say most accidents happen from 10 to 1 p.m. on the weekends. And this is, you know, and if we don't have those accidents, that gives the ER more time to take care of the patients that are getting sick from this virus. I'm also saving protective um, equipment for them. So um, it's, it's really important to see um, that perspective that, you know, we're not putting, I don't think we're putting this curfew to, to create fear. We're, we're putting this curfew to give hope and to give um, people uh, a quality of life and the chance of life to pursue happiness. And, um, and I, just, I just wanted to give you um, my perspective of my experience and um, hopefully you know, that can give citizens a better uh, perspective as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's it for the members of the audience here. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to take a five-minute break. Um, everybody look and watches. My watch says 2.30. What do you guys got? 2.33. So we'll be back at 2.38. Okay? All right. We'll be back at 2.38. Everybody, everybody please be muted.
Okay. Everybody else back? We're, um, right. we, we have sent someone out to the hallway to make sure that anyone that's in the hallway returns. Okay. But you may start All whenever right. you'd like. Okay. We'll go ahead and, and reconvene. Um, Commissioner Trace, you are actually up first. So I have you on the board first. Uh, yes. Uh, was hoping that we might be able to resend this, but after listening to Jacob, uh, Director Sauer, those numbers are incredible, which basically means we have less people on the road, less, less people having wrecks, less people getting tickets, less people causing, uh, taking away resources from our EMS and our sheriff. And so we're actually, we're not doing this out of fear. We're trying to help the people that have to respond to this emergency, our EMS, and our sheriffs. And I would love to say that we would just tell people not to go out from 11 to five, but uh, unfortunately our citizens have proven that we asked them not to congregate, not to have more than 10. And the minute the weekend came, we still are chasing them off of Beer Cannon Island and Passage Key even last weekend. So we have to put these effects into order so that we can help our people. So I'm making a motion for the recommended resolution. And I do uh, thank you all for taking the private properties out. That's very nice. We have a motion and we have a second by Commissioner Whitmore, right? Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue with uh, uh, comments. Next up, I have Commissioner Baugh. Ma Madam Chair, can we get a verbal second from Commissioner Whitmore, please? Yeah, she has to get Second by Commissioner Whitmore. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Ball. Well, I don't know why I'm bothering. Thank you. My uh, raised hand for some reason wouldn't work, but I understand there were a couple of other commissioners having the same issue. Imagine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit shocked at some of the stuff I'm hearing because I don't think the whole story is being told. Um, you know, I just heard someone from Manatee Memorial say that it's their job to... Um, to, to guide us. Well, you know, does that include Blake uh, Hospital as well, or is that just Manatee Memorial? Because I can tell you that's not what I'm hearing from Blake. Um, you know, I'm hearing that they have everything under control in case of any surge. They're, they're doing fine. I, I know the employees there, the nurses, doctors, et cetera, are stressed, uh, but they have it under control and, and they're doing their job because that's what they signed up for. They know that it's their job. And I don't think that this curfew really is about, um, you know, the hospitals or anything else. Um, I, I think that we need to really appreciate the people that are on the front of all this. But, you know, it's not, we're not there. We knew this week and next week are going to be tough. We already knew that. We knew it. You knew deaths were going to go up. You knew the positive cases were going to go up. And if something does happen or we have a major uh, uh, problem, you know, with the, the nursing homes or something like that, then Blake says, yes, it could be an issue. So I understand, and I'm thankful that they feel like that they have things basically under control for right now. Uh, but I don't think that really has anything to do with the curfew. I don't think any of the people that are out from 11 to 5 really, um, you know, are the ones that we're really concerned about as far as, as uh, the coronavirus. I mean, it, I, I'll be honest with you. My daughter is in uh, quarantine. She's a nurse in Virginia. She called me this morning. She's in quarantine. That means my three grandchildren are also now in quarantine. But, you know, she said to me, she said, Mom... She said, we took every precaution possible. I feel good. I think it's going to be okay. Um, she said, but you know what? She said, it's worth it to try and help people. And, um, you know, God bless our nurses and our doctors for what they're going through. But, you know, I don't think that's what this curfew is all about. I, I think the sheriff summed it up in the first five minutes of this meeting. I don't even know why we're still having this discussion other than I think some people are right, maybe we are blowing this out of proportion as commissioners. You know, the sheriff said, they're going to follow the governor's order. No, nothing else needs to be said. We don't have to have a separate curfew 
to follow the governor's order. He has already said, um, you know, we are to stay at home. And, and I think that's the whole thing behind this. I, I think the sheriff has this under control. And I understand this policy group uh, is very concerned, and I understand, Jake, where you're coming from, and, and I really do. And, and I know our EMS and our deputies are concerned, just as our nurses and doctors. And unfortunately, you know, they are on the front line of this. Uh, and that's what they do for a living, and, and we need to take care of them, absolutely. But you know what? I know that there's some deputies now that aren't in court because court's not being convened. So I do know that we need to, and not we, that's really up to Jake uh, with EMS and, um, you know, with, with the sheriff. Um, so I don't see how the two really go together. I think that it's already been said. The governor's order says we are to stay home. And then he gives, the governor gave instruction as to what that meant to the people that could be out. And I think we need to order the, follow the governor's order. I think the rest of this is just, um, you know, I think it is being blown out of proportion because it's already there. It's already there. The, guy, the sheriff's already said, he's not going to arrest people. That's not what he, they, the, you know, the deputies want to do. I think our people, the citizens in Manatee are stressed enough and I know I am just from sitting here listening to all of you. Um, you know, it's not something that we need to put more on our citizens than what they've already been given. They've already changed their entire lives. Half of them aren't even working anymore. And now you're telling them they have to absolutely stay home between 11 and 5. And if they don't, well, gee, nothing's really going to happen, is it? Because the sheriff's not going to arrest them unless they're breaking the law in some way. Certainly not because they're out from 11 to 5. Give our citizens a break. We have taken everything basically away from them. You keep it up, and they're going to rebel. And when they do, we'll all be at the jail for safekeeping. That's what's going to happen. We need to be helping our citizens, not making it harder for them. I'll bet you if we took this curfew off and we gave them an opportunity, they would probably pretty much abide by what the sheriff has said about the governor's order. The sheriff was right. Half of them didn't know about the governor's order. It had only been in place a day before you guys came up with this curfew. A day. Not even hardly 24 hours. Give them a break. Have a little bit more faith in your citizen than that. And, you know, I, I'm not going to speak after this. I'll just vote. But, you know, you want to talk about the boat ramps. I understand we're supposed to get a presentation about the boat ramps and how we did the right thing. The governor said the boat ramps are to be closed. Well, that's not exactly true. Talk to Tallahassee. They'll tell you differently. We already made mistakes, people with the resolution that was done, or it wouldn't have been changed today. Enough already. Let the citizens be able to breathe. Let them be able to help us, and then we can help them. I think we, we are blowing this out of proportion. Not the coronavirus, but in, the, in what we're trying to do to the citizens that are trying to survive all this. That's what I think we're, we're blowing uh, out of proportion. I think our hospitals have things under control. They know that it's a possibility if a nursing home or something like that um, had major issues, it would put a stress, but they're all working together in case that does happen. The hospitals have their acts together and we need to have our act together as well. Thank you, have a good day. Commissioner Serbia. Thank you very much for the time to speak. So I want to start by saying thank you to everyone who came down to Chambers to give their input. Um, I am thankful from hearing for, from all of you, the commissioners, um, and I know I've already talked to our staff about this, but we need to quickly put procedures in place to make it as easy as possible for the public to participate in these virtual meetings. Because 
I think it is so important to hear everybody's opinion. And I believe it's most important for me to hear from the people that I disagree with. So it makes me a better person. It makes me a better commissioner. It challenges me to think differently. So I just want to say that uh, thank you very much to everyone. Um, you know, we talked a lot today about our Constitution. And, you know, one of the difficult things with our Constitution that I always learned in college is that it tells us what we can do, but it doesn't tell us what's prohibited. And so sometimes interpreting the Constitution is difficult for that reason. What I do know is that the U.S. Constitution requires government to protect its citizens from foreign and domestic threats, okay? And I think uh, as we talk about the Constitution, it's also very important for people to remember that originally when it was written, it was written to protect the white man. It was not protected. It was not giving protection to people of color or to women. And thank goodness we've gone beyond that, you know? So things change throughout time. Um, we've heard a lot about civil rights, and one of the things that I'm reminded of is sometimes civil rights are balanced with protecting the public safety. Think about the Baker Act, and I think about this because my daughter is in the mental health industry. You know, the government has the right to Baker Act someone, to take them against their will for 72 hours so that they can get the help that they need to protect them. You know, somebody might argue that's a violation of civil rights, but I would argue it's a way of protecting the public. Um, one of the things that um, I also want to say is that I look to the public health experts to recommend whether certain restrictions are needed to slow the virus. I'm not going to make that decision from a political position because that's inappropriate. We've got to rely on our experts. Uh, and when implementing this curfew again for another seven days, we have to ask ourselves, is the curfew reasonable? We need to consider the hours and the duration. Is it reasonable to ask people to stay at home between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m.? They still have the ability to shop for groceries, to take care of their families, to go to the doctor or, and do the essential things, work, whatever they need to do. To me, it sounds like it's reasonable and the duration is just seven days. Things change so quickly. Maybe next week it won't be reasonable. You know, given the physical and the economic devastation that COVID-19 has caused, we need to ask ourselves, does this justify removing the right to assemble on public lands at night between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. to further protect the public health? When I ask myself that, I, I answer it does. I don't think anybody should underestimate the danger of this pandemic. Now, I agree we don't also want to underestimate the threat to our civil liberties, but this pandemic is killing people. You know, I heard one of the speakers talk about fear, that this, you know, people are afraid now to go out of their house in the middle of the night that they're going to be arrested. That is not going to happen. Our sheriff is training his deputies to reasonably ask people to please comply if they are assembling in groups and go home. You want to talk about fear? Talk about the people who are afraid because they're really sick right now. Talk about our, talk to our hospital workers. There's fear. I just talked to a guy on the break. He told me he can't breathe. His chest is so tight. What can he do? That's fear. And I'm really pleased about our government, uh, our governor's order. You know, Governor DeSantis has done a great job. And one of the things that I love about him is that he doesn't like to interfere in local government. 
he issued what is called a baseline order, and he said, I know that every local government is different and every community is different, so if you need to add to that, do it. So we can't just rely on the governor's order. It's not appropriate it's the same in Miami-Dade as it is in the Panhandle as it is in Manatee. We, the local government has to weigh in on that and do what's right. And then finally, I'm going to say that, you know, Reggie and I have districts with the most COVID-19 cases, with the most at-risk population. And so I'm responsible to helping to protect those people. And that's why I am going to support an extension of this curfew for seven more days. Thank you. Thank you. I have Commissioner Whitmore, then Commissioner Johnson. First of all, uh, Misty, if your person really has chest tightness, I sound like Dr. Sanjay Gupta on television, but if they really do, they need to go, and no faces, please. Um, they need to go to the emergency room, and they can be driven there. But they, you know, that, that's one of the classic symptoms is every doctor there. And from the only one that actually is an RN that's on the board, of course I made this um, second of this motion. I'm actually working today. I'm in the, I'm, I don't do patient care because I'm high risk, but I am here taking care of the nurses and, and helping them. So anyway, leadership is public safety. You all know that. I've been in office a long time, and I'm proud of it. But leadership is public safety. That is our role. Um, my friend Ruth Lyerly is there. I've known her for many, many years. And regarding the boat ramps, and I'm, I'm, Bill Clegg will probably go over that in a little bit. Um, we did let the citizens go out. And for me, that somebody, you know, living on the island, used to be mayor, I still get tons of calls. People did not follow the distancing. We called the sheriff, and sheriff can attest to that, hopefully, uh, when we allowed the boaters to go out and they were... Um, um, congregating on Passage Key, even after we closed our boat ramps, they went on the uh, they went on the others, and there's 30 boats. That, you're not even supposed to be on Passage Key; it's a bird sanctuary. Um, so they weren't complying, and the sheriff was having a lot of uh, problems with this, and that's why you see what you see. There's six firemen and 11 EMS that have been exposed or quarantined. What do you think that's doing to our staffing, everyone? We have 18 or 19 EMS trucks for the entire 630 square miles of Manatee County. Um, two docs I know personally are quarantined right now. Their patients were positive. They can't even go to work, and they're doing telemedicine. So um, I think you all need to know that. And there's a few things. I, Dr. Godofsky, I've known him for years. Uh, he's one of our leading infectious disease doctors in Manatee County, and the commissioners received his letter. He supports this. He's infectious disease. He knows what's going on in all three hospitals. Dr. Farber, who's a hospitalist in Lakewood Ranch, he's written us two letters in two days. He knows what's going on. He's working there today. And you're, you're talking about, um, I want to read you something from um, a physician that I hadn't met yet, and it's real quick. My name is Barry Severs, MD, and I'm writing you in concerns over your termination of the curfew you put in place last week. I am the chief anesthesiologist at Manatee Memorial, and I have intubated and managed several COVID patients. Trust me when I say this is stressful and heartbreaking. Even worse was driving out of the hospital, seeing 200 plus kids at the skate park on their skateboards and bikes playing on the river walk park, all hanging out, not practicing social distancing. You see, if they want to get sick, it is their business. But when they come to the hospital and infect us, it's our business. You all have beautiful obligations to protect us, and I hope that you will take that as seriously as you take the care of these patients. This 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew is a good thing, even if you take some heat. Please keep it in, the pla in place past our projected peak, which hasn't even reached yet. With all the bars closed, what are the people who want to be out during those hours really missing? Dr. Barry Severs. Um, there's a few other things I wanted to mention. Um, we're not trying to scare anybody. We're just trying to give you information. If it makes you nervous, then maybe you'll actually pay attention to what the governor has directed us to do and the county has. This is all about public safety. We're not trying to scare you. If we didn't tell you the information, we'd hear it from the other side. Um, Dr. Hader, I see you're there. Thank you very much. Yes, Manatee has a COVID unit. 
Manatee's getting ready to open up their second COVID unit. They have patients on ventilators today. Blake has patients. Lakewood Ranch had the first death in Manatee County. They have patients. And um, there's a 30-year-old at one of the three hospitals that's on her second period of being intubated with COVID. She's in her 30s. Dr. Marcialis, um, I want to thank you. I know you've been working hard. I've, you've invited me to a few conference calls with the medical community. They've worked very hard with the out, out private practices to try to get this when the hospitals need us. I want you all to know that Lake, Lakewood and Ranch and Manatee have all supported this. I talked to the administrator of, sorry, Vanessa, I see the face again. Let's all try to be um, professional. I talked to the administrator of Lake a couple days ago. He sent a flyer out to Austin employees asking them to write us a letter on supporting this. And I'm, you all got letters from Lake LeBrand, so obviously I'm telling the truth. Barry Grooms, you all know Barry Grooms. He just texted me and told me to use his name because he didn't want to be there because of social distancing, that he supports this for a few 100%. Manatee Hospital's death rate, Manatee uh, County's death rate is 6% and the state is 2%. That's the facts. We're not trying to scare you. This is a public safety issue. So of course I'm going to support this, and I'm going to support the medical community that actually are leaving their families at night and having to do this. So um, when it's time, because we do hear about the boat ramp, and me being on the island, hear about it probably a lot, same, and, and I hear where, where Ruth's coming from. I looked at, and I found where the governor's order does say that. But our other neighboring counties are Law on boat ramps. Let's hold off till we're done with this Let me motion on the floor that doesn't right. pertain to boat ramps, please. So we and can move on. And that's fine. Uh, that's fine. But I, what I just said is I didn't say now. I said I want Bill to explain it while Ruth is still in the audience if she's still it. Thank you. Okay, Reggie, I'm going to go. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about just the broad perspective of this and when the healthcare worker came in talking about teen humanity I think we all know someone or have knowledge of someone that um, is either tested positive or having some medical conditions or, um, or experiences um, that could potentially impact them this has hit home personally for me I mean I pray for a loved one once or twice a day that's in the hospital right now. Um, and I pray that she's doing well. And I think about listening to Commissioner um, Ball talking about her daughter. You know, I, I have a sister and other friends and loved ones. When we talk about team humanity and, and public safety, um, this is what this resolution is about. And the reality is this is a stride for us to unite and come together in our county to flatten the curve. And that's what we're trying to do right here. This is an effort for us to flatten the curve. And I don't want a political twist. And I don't think we should have a political twist on this. This is an opportunity for us to, for us to unite and show support, care, and concern for those who are on the front line every day, making sure our loved ones are protected. Fear, confession. Yes, I'm scared. For the ones that are on the front line, for the ones that are going through the medical experiences right now, and for the ones that could possibly be positive and don't even know. We have a lot of questions that are unanswered right here. And this is an opportunity for us to do something to flatten the curve. And that's the stride, and that's why I support this resolution to continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Sorry, I skipped you, Commissioner Johnson, because you're... But as a push, oh. I know you want to speak. Go ahead. I'm going to get to talk. I'm stunned. You are. You are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, since again, my little flag thing wasn't working. But um, you know, I, I, I won't say much because I normally don't. But it's um, you know, I've heard nothing today that's indicated to me that I should change my opinion from what it was a week ago. Um, I think the issues are still the same. I think the the resolution is primarily a huge scare tactic, and I think we've done a pretty good job of scaring the community. Um, the one story I'll share with you, and I don't know if you all saw it, but one of my constituents had emailed me. She's an ER nurse. She works a 3 to 11 shift, 
and she comes home and she's with her husband who's retired Air Force and she's really stressed out because it's been a tough day. And so she likes, they like to go out and jog at night. And they're like, oh my God, you know, it's 1130. You know, we can't go out. Are we going to get arrested? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, and they like, you know, some people are more nocturnal than others. You know, maybe we should sit there and put a curfew in from 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon. You know, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not saying I have the answer, but I think this curfew, you know, is, is, is nothing more than scaring a lot of people and everybody's already scared. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, my daughter and my grandson now are in quarantine because she had contact with somebody who tried to give their animal back to them out of honor. She, her husband's in the hospital in Port Charlotte, you know, this and that. And so now I've got my six month old, my daughter, you know, worrying about whether they're going to test positive, you know, and I haven't talked to anybody who isn't already scared. And, and I think the county or the, the state with this, you know, the governor's declaration, the president's, you know, the sheriff has all the tools he needs, you know, to do it. And this is nothing more than, again, to me, is another way of scaring people. And we don't need to do that. We've already effectively done that. I think, you know, you know, go, you know, go watch Good Morning America, you know, in the morning, you know, and for two hours, what are you going to see? You know, I don't even watch it anymore because by the time, by nine o'clock, I'm thoroughly depressed. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, they're scaring and they're, the message has gotten out there is socially distance, wash your hands, you know, and stay away, you know, type of thing. And, you know, God bless us. I hope, you know, this thing will pass. I'm, I don't, you know, whether the line's going to flatten or not. You know, we'll, we won't know till we have 2020 hindsight down the road. But so, I, I, again, I'm just, you know, I'm not in favor of continuing the, a resolution that's just going to keep scaring, you know, the people in Manatee County. So that's, you know, and that's, you know, my bottom line on the whole thing. Thank you. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit and uh, this issue of scaring people. Yeah, I said that. And um, it was. Uh, based on the time we were in, I have to admit, since I sit on the policy group and the policy group meets on Wednesday afternoons and last Wednesday, I guess it was just the Wednesday before this, um, we were considering a stay in place um, uh, order, safer in place, whatever you want to call it, because the governor had not yet issued such an order and that was on the agenda. and. The reason was because people were not staying home. People were not abiding by the governor's um, recommendation at that time. There was no order when we were looking at this. There was no mandated stay in place. That happened virtually at the same time the policy group was meeting. So um, then once we heard about it and we talked about it and we saw that it didn't apply to private property, there was a concern raised by law enforcement whether or not it could be enforced, such as the uh, event that happened in the city. There was a concern whether or not you could disband people on private property. That was my understanding. That's why it happened. That's why we talked about doing it. Subsequent to that, we have heard from law enforcement. Again, the law enforcement are on these calls with the policy group. It is not just the sheriff and his team, his legal team. It is also um, all of the chiefs of police that get together and talk about this. And they said that, that they were concerned about it happening on private property. I can tell you that the uh, mayor and Anna Maria is still concerned about gatherings on private property. He was not in favor of relaxing this, changing this. So it isn't like everybody is saying that everything could be done by the governor's order. The fact is the governor's order specifically says that local government has the opportunity to enact stricter regulations. It says that in the Q&A that was printed and handed out um, because local government has the police power. That's who's in charge of making sure this happens. But I, you know, I don't want people to be scared, but I want them to abide by the governor's order. I want them to take this seriously. I can tell you that in my family we have, we have people that have um, compromised immune systems, so we're concerned about contact. So we're doing this. 
I, um, it, it's so important right now. Dr. Fauci just said it. The reason why we're starting to flatten the curve is because people are abiding by this order. Dr. Burke said it. So now is not the time to let up on the pedal. We have to keep doing this social distancing if we're going to make a difference. Regarding the curfew, I was surprised when it came up at the policy group meeting a week ago Wednesday. I didn't know anything about having a curfew. Didn't come from this commissioner. It came from our public safety officials. It came from Jake. It came from the sheriff. It came from the police chief. It didn't come from the islands per se. They all said, eh, we already roll up the streets at 9 o'clock pretty much on the islands. They weren't so concerned about it. They were supportive of it. They were supportive again last Wednesday. When, or, was it Wednesday? Yeah, when the vote was taken. And there wasn't a vote. We just go around and ask everybody what they think. So I want to be clear about that that people are supportive of it. They're supportive because of what we've been told today, because it reduces the exposure of our first responders to people that might be COVID positive. If they don't have to go out to a call, they don't have to have the PPEs and don't have to burn it up. So I, I really want to hear from Jake and Sheriff Wells. We do have to make the case for this. I think I've heard the case made. But if, if they tell me we don't need a curfew, I don't want to have a curfew. I've never been under a curfew before in my life, except for they told somebody I found out there was a curfew when I was a kid. Midnight curfew, didn't know it, found out quickly. Um, but as far as being in Manatee County, to my knowledge, I've never been under a curfew. Never before. I don't want to take away or restrict anyone's rights. But I've been told this will help us get through this. So... I can listen to everyone tell me about taking away people's rights, restricting people's rights. As I said before, I, there are so many rights being restricted right now. There's right to, right to work. You know, all of our restaurants are shut down. I know restaurant owners that are losing their business. Talk about their right to support their family. People's jobs are being taken away. It's, it's, it's a time which, um, you know, we're going to have a, Tough time recovering from it, but we need to get there. We need to have the right to life first, in my opinion. So I'm going to ask Jake and Sheriff Wells, you tell me we don't need this curfew. We could quit it today. I'll follow your, your recommendation. This board didn't make this curfew up. It came forth. It was already a recommended uh, action, and this board solidified that action. So I'm going to ask Jake and Sheriff Wells to comment on that. I can go. Uh, I can go first. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier in uh, my opening statements, the, the data that um, we have gathered from uh, the different departments, as well as uh, some of the, the sheriff and some of the police departments, uh, this isn't. Uh, I've heard some some back and forth about um, we use the curfew time to give EMFs or deputies and law enforcement off. That's that's not the case. I I, I don't know where that came from. They don't get off. Um, they're still working. It, we use the curfew to minimize the reduction that the first responders have in coming in contact with the other individuals out um, doing things, especially over the weekends at night during the curfew. So uh, traffic crashes down 70%. Those still occur. Those still occur every day, and our paramedics have to decide. Am I treating the trauma, and am I... Securing that airway right now, today, at, at the very minute that I need to, or do I put on PPE first? So I, I don't know how much more clear I can be about that. I'll turn it over to the sheriff. Now, Jake, you, you've been uh, very clear about that, and we're here to, to support that. So basically, the curfew has brought the, the proper amount of attention to the executive order. And, and I think people have listened to what this group uh, has uh, has had to say. We are just trying to limit the amount of people on the roadway at night. We are not trying to restrict freedom. Bottom line, you cannot be out there for any other reason already. All right, so essential services, essential activities. Commissioner Johnson, if that nurse wants to go jogging around her neighborhood at 3 o'clock in the morning, she has that right. The governor has that right. No one is going to restrict that. People are 
good, bad, or indifferent, uh, Commissioner. They're listening to what we have said um, about the curfew a lot more than what they have complied with as far as the executive order. Thank you. Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question for Jake. Because I was told earlier in the meeting that the resident in my district who's contacted me with severe symptoms should go to um, NCYR, Manatee Rural Health Services. And he wrote back to me to say he did, and he was there again today, and they turned him away because he's not an existing patient. They will not test him. So what can I offer this gentleman? I don't, I don't know. I have not heard that. I, I've personally spoken to MCR. I, I, I um, speak to Dr. Colgate um, frequently. Uh, as, as early as this morning, as well as Dr. Bensey. And we're all in agreement that MCR health is where, um, that is the fastest way for them to get tested. Now, they can also call the, the Florida Department of Health local manatee line, um, and they can assist them as, assist him as well um, in getting tested. If he doesn't have a primary care position, MCR will be the fastest way for him to get tested. Um, now, he does now, does he not? meet the guidelines, I'm not sure. Um, you know, we're still rationing tests. We're getting in shipments of tests, and maybe, I, I, I don't want to speak for that. I, um, I don't know the entire story, um, but MCR is, is, the, is the, the best way if he does not have a, a primary care position to get tested. Um, and Jake, just to be clear, um, this gentleman has a primary care physician. That physician wrote a prescription and is very concerned that this gentleman has COVID-19, asked him to go and be tested, and he's just trying to find a test. Okay, MCR has plenty of tests, um, and they, they, they'll be able to, and once we get off of this call, I will make a yeah. call to Dr. Colgate to uh, clarify that. But and we have a motion on the floor, so I, I'm gonna try to restrict the conversation to just most, and I know it's a very important question, Misty. Hopefully you can call them directly and make sure that um, your citizen gets the attention they need. I know it's been confusing for a lot of people how you do get tested. So, uh, Commissioner Whitmore, you're up next. Yeah, just two things. Irma was, there was a mandatory curfew. Mickey, Mickey couldn't recall it. I, and I remember actually um, at Manatee High School in 69, we had a curfew, but we couldn't get the records then. But I did remember Irma. And Mickey did confirm that we did have a curfew. So I wanted to confirm that. and. Uh, and that one patient there, I just texted Dr. Colgate and Patrick, and uh, just, if you're not, a, that patient in Anna Maria didn't have a doctor except VA in St. Pete. That's why he got in. So that may be why, but um, uh, Jake will take care of that. Um, and there's, there's just one other thing um, with the, after this motion to ask that when we talk, um, I'd like to know um, why caregivers can't know which, pay, which independent living skilled nursing have COVID patients because it affects how we care. And I'll check with that one later. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Mr. Mr. Trace. I was going to call the question, but I see no one else on the board. All right. We have a motion to approve the resolution that's before you. Um, Y'all know what's in the resolution, I believe. So I'm going to um, call for, do I, I want to do this by a, we're doing it by a vote, voice vote. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Whitmore. How do you vote? Aye. Aye. Um, Commissioner Servia, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Trace, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Bellamy, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Baugh, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Banak votes aye. Motion passes. All right. You guys want to talk about the votes quickly <laughs> before we go to our second action, which is a letter to the governor to support extension. You want to talk about boats now since I don't know if we still have people in the audience that were concerned about the boats and the boat issue. Um, Commissioner is that Burnett, too scary? There are no, um, there are only two um, remaining people in the audience. Neither spoke uh, about boats or the other issues. Thank you. All right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead very quickly and go to the second item that's on our agenda before we talk about the boating situation. This is execution of a letter to Governor DeSantis supporting the extension of Executive Order 20-87 regarding vacation rental closures. And I can tell you um, 
the policy group was in uh, unanimous support of this and asked us to, um, in fact, enact such a um, such an order restricting it. And I said, um, I, I said I didn't think that was something that um, that this board had talked about before and it would likely take on at this time. And I I did. Um, suggest perhaps we could do a letter to the governor encouraging him. As you know, the governor had uh, signed such a, a order restricting the vacation rentals, and, um, but that expired today, I believe, Sherry. Is that correct? Correct. So um, that's, that's what this letter is about. Sherry, is there anything else I missed? I... No, ma'am. Okay. So uh, anyone have any comments? Commissioner Johnson, I saw you waving your hand. I just, um, I'd like to make a motion that we authorize the chair, it says chairman, but let's say chairwoman here, okay. to the letter to Governor Ron DeSantis supporting the extension of Executive Order 20-87 regarding vacation rentals. All right, do I have a second to that, please? Misty is uh, waving a second, I think I saw first, but we need you on voice to say that, according to the county attorney. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore, did you have a comment? Okay, anyone else have a comment? Somebody waving their hand? All right, I'll go ahead and uh, ask for the vote. Commissioner Whitmore? Aye. Commissioner Servia? Aye. Commissioner Trace? Aye. Commissioner Bellamy? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Baugh? Aye. Commissioner Banak votes aye. Okay. Now, on the boat issue, Commissioner Servia, did you, I, I can't remember, did you have specific questions or do we go right to uh, the county attorney at this point on the county boat attorney. issue? Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, I do have a lot of questions, but maybe it's best if we hear from the county attorney first and okay. then I can ask my questions. Okay. Uh, county attorney Bill Clegg, if you would go ahead and explain um, your research that you've done into the, the boat issue and that in the closure of the boat ramps was done two weeks ago I, somebody help me i'm trying to go from memory how long ago did the closure of the boat ramps come down and i believe it came down through the um policy committee right jake can you tell me when the boat ramps were closed it did not come down to the well i, I take that back it, it went through the policy committee um every everyone was um in agreement on that I'm looking for the date. Sherry, do you remember the exact date? I'm looking. Or maybe Bill Clegg knows and Bill can explain it in his research. All right. Um, John, can you just confirm that my audio feed is okay at this volume? Yes, sir. You can hear me all right? Yes. Sir. All right. So for the benefit of the viewing public, I'm the Chief Assistant County Attorney Bill Clegg. Mr. Palmer has asked me to look at this issue and handle it. Um, I've been practicing here 16 years, and I've handled most of the water use-related issues during that time that I've been here. So, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, the issue of the boat ramps and marinas and other marine-related uses obviously remains a matter of intense controversy. That's true here in the county, but if you Google Florida boat ramp closures, you'll see that that is a, an issue of controversy throughout the state. There are some counties where they are closed and others where they are not. So what I'm going to try to do today is to just walk you through a brief summary of the legal framework that controls the issue. Uh, unlike last Friday when we were putting things together in great haste, I've had a little more time to put this together. And so I hope that it can clarify things as best as we can under the circumstances. But then after that, I will ask Jake um, to explain the most recent discussions about the issue at the policy group, because that is also very important. So there's obviously a lot of talk about the governor's executive order that was issued last week. And that order requires any service that is non-essential or any activity that is non-essential to cease during the COVID-19 emergency. And I stated at last week's meeting that those orders, or it's really two orders because there was an amendment shortly after he issued the first order, are a very challenging read because they attach exhibits, one from the federal government and a few from Miami-Dade County, 
to explain the definition of essential services. And some of those exhibits, the Miami-Dade County exhibits, reference other orders that are not attached to the governor's order. I have a lot of admiration for how the governor's office has handled this emergency. It's unprecedented. I mean, just the last two hours and 15 minutes that the board has been talking, I've been practicing 24 years. I've never dealt with anything like this, and I've handled a lot of difficult stuff for local governments, but this is unprecedented. But nevertheless, I have to say that because the exhibits to the orders were somewhat complicated, it has created a lot of confusion among the public about what is essential or not essential, and that's particularly true in the case of marine services like boat ramps. But one very helpful feature of the governor's order is that it also directs state agencies to compile a list of essential services and activities and publish that on the state's website. That was not available in time for the meeting last Friday, but it went up over the weekend or maybe late Friday. I don't, I'm not exactly sure. And so now that is available online. It is on the website for the State Division of Emergency Management. The web address is floridadisaster.org. And when you go onto that page, the link to the list is right at the top of the page. So the public can now go onto that website and see the list of services and activities that are essential under the governor's order, which is easier than trying to figure it out by going through all of those exhibits. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm dependent on my device because we do not have our document camera today, is I'm going to try to show you the, the list itself and the language that deals with boat ramps and marinas. And I've learned that if I use the camera facing this way, it will be backwards, which I think will be very annoying to a lot of people. So what I'm going to have to do is reverse the camera on my device. So you're going to see in a moment the other side of my office. Um, but that's an easier way for me to show you uh, the documents so that you can see for yourselves and the public can see for themselves uh, what is online. And the important point here is that the county attorney's office is in the role of reporting this to the board. We are the messengers here. Uh, we didn't generate this stuff. We recognize it as upset quite a few people, but it is our job to explain it. So what I'm going to show you first, and I'm sorry, but I have to kind of reach around my iPad. This is just a printout of the first page of the floridadisaster.org website. And you can see here the link to essential services and activities. So when you go on there, that's what you find. And then when you click that link, it will take you to the list itself. And this is just the first page of it. And your computer will tell you when this comes up that the list is 19 pages long. It's very extensive. Um, and again, it lists everything that can remain open or take place as essential under this emergency. The pages on the list are not numbered, so it is a little difficult for me to guide you to the exact language. My experience has been the easiest way to find it is to do a term search of the list for the term marina, and that will jump you about 10 pages down to the language that controls. And I've highlighted it here, and I'm going to bring it up closer. This is the best I can do for a document camera. And, John, I hope everyone can see this. Are you able to, to sort of... Um, blow me up as the speaker view so it's a little easier for people to follow what's going on. I am, I am going to read it, but I just want people to be able to see it for themselves as well. So what it says is marinas, boat launches, docking, fueling, marine supply, and other marine services only as set forth in Miami-Dade County Emergency Order 0620 as amended prior to April 3rd, 2020. And this is where we're getting a lot of confusion about what's going on with boat ramps and marinas because the list still refers you to a um, local Miami order. It's pretty clear. It says boat launches, which covers boat ramps, are listed as an essential service, but it says only as set forth in that Miami-Dade local order as amended prior to April 3rd. And 
in my view, and I think a lot of attorneys, a lot of my fellow attorneys would agree, it would probably be better to just spell it out on the list itself rather than forcing people to go find these orders. It's difficult to access them. You have to do Google searches. They're not available <coughs> online. But to understand what the governor's order does, you then have to go to the last amendment to that order. So I'm not going to walk you through the original order and every amendment because, quite honestly, it's just going to belabor a lot of detail that doesn't get you to the end point. Um, if you look at the highlighted language on the bottom of the page here, that's the first page of Amendment 3 to Order 0620. That is the language that is referenced in the governor's order that deals with marinas and boat ramps. Last week, I read to you language from Amendment 2. And as I said, these are difficult to find. And going back over this stuff this week, I found there was a, another amendment, Amendment 3. They're very similar. There's very little that's changed um, in terms of the end result. But if, you know, I apologize if there's any confusion. As I've said, this is challenging stuff to navigate. But what it says at the bottom of the page here is all marinas, boat launches, docking, fueling, marine supply, and other marina services in the incorporated and unincorporated areas of Miami-Dade County shall close effective immediately. So that's basically the same language that I read to you at the meeting last Friday, and the easiest way to refer to it is as the closure language. But it's also correct that on the next page of that Miami-Dade order, which is referenced in the governor's order, there are some important exceptions. And what I said to you last week was there is an exception for licensed saltwater commercial fishing. That exception is still there. They added some additional ex exceptions. And those deal with law enforcement and rescue. I think it's safe to switch back now. Ferries, liveaboards, international navigation, and emergency maintenance. The difficulty is there is no exception in that order for recreational boating or recreational fishing. So that means that those services, marinas and boat ramps, are considered non-essential under the governor's order for purposes of supporting those uses. Now, it is absolutely correct that the governor's order also talks about recreation as being an essential activity, and it mentions fishing as one of the examples. And so I think this has created, in the minds of a lot of people, some, some conflict between what it says about marinas and boat ramps and what it says about what people can go out and do on the water. And obviously, it's very difficult to engage in recreational fishing and recreational boating if you are dependent on a marina or a boat ramp to do that. And I think that's where a lot of people are upset by this. As I said, we are the messengers here. We're just showing you what the orders themselves say. We're not advocating for them or advocating for a particular interpretation of them. But I do need to talk about how this works in practice, how it works out in the world. So we really need to talk about enforcement. As I stated last week, under the Emergency Management Act, Chapter 252 of Florida Statutes, law enforcement, takes the lead role in enforcing emergency orders. But it is also true that law enforcement has to exercise judgment and discretion in deciding when and where to enforce them. Because of the limited resources they have, they have them all the time, but particularly in an emergency. So we should not expect sheriff's deputies or municipal police officers to be driving down the road stopping at each business to see if it's essential by checking it against the 19-page list. They do not have the resources to do that. So the first line of responsibility in a situation like this is on the individual or the business or the operation itself to determine whether or not it is essential under the governor's order. And as some people have already mentioned, last Thursday afternoon, the governor held a press conference in which he emphasized that the most important issue is how people are conducting themselves, whether they are respecting social distancing guidelines 
and minimizing the risk of spread of the virus. And we should expect that to also guide how law enforcement handles things in terms of enforcing the orders, focusing on places where they see conduct that is a risk or a problem. The difference is if something is essential, like say a drugstore or a grocery store, and law enforcement sees a problem there, the most it can do is ask people to respect social distancing guidelines. Conversely, if, it, if law enforcement sees that somewhere that is non-essential, and under the governor's order that does include boat ramps and marinas, then law enforcement can say, I'm going to close this down because I see problems here. So that's really the way the board should think about it. It is more about how law enforcement handles a problem than policing the details of a list. It's not like a code enforcement situation. This stuff is not codified. We are in an emergency, and that and it is a different type of process when you're faced with an emergency. I want to talk for a moment about a, what is really a related but separate issue, which is the county's own boat ramps, because those are owned and operated by the county as county facilities. So. The county does have the legal authority to close them regardless of the governor's order. And that is, in fact, what we did because we closed them. My recollection is it was the emergency meeting a week prior to last Friday's meeting. I think it was two emergency meetings back. We closed the ramps. And the governor's order obviously had not been issued yet. And I'll just be candid with you all as a, a lifelong voter and as one of a number of attorneys in this office who have over many years provided legal support for the county's very robust voting access program, of which I think a lot of people in the county are very proud. It is very difficult to see them close down. Nobody is happy about it. It is a difficult thing to have to do. It, the, the ramps that we have represent many years of public investment. To, to get the great system and program that we have. The board could reopen them from a legal standpoint, but if you do, you should understand that it then becomes the responsibility of law enforcement to, to decide whether or not to close them back down. And I do have to caution you against that because in these circumstances, I think the professional views of the people in the policy group should carry great weight with the board. It's your decision to make, but those views should carry great weight because many of the people in that group, particularly the, the representatives of law enforcement, and it's not just our sheriff, it's local law enforcement, municipal law enforcement agencies as well, are dealing with this crisis every day on the front line. They're closely monitoring what's going on in the field. And so with that, I would ask Jake to just give us an update on the discussions that have happened at the policy group about this situation and where where they stand on it. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions commissioners have after Jake has had a chance to explain that. And and I understand we've lost visual with Jake. Yeah, we can see yeah my, my, uh, my Wi-Fi is out. I'm on LTE, so I'm, I'm a little scared to get back in because it's going to be choppy. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, it seems like a year ago. It seems like a year ago, but um, on March 26th is when um, we made the decision to close the boat ramps. Um, and that was a week after um, that weekend when all the, the CDC guidelines came down from the governor's office. Um, we had a lot of um, commissioners as well as um, city councilmen all talking about everyone congregating on the island. Um, so at the next policy meeting, that was a uh, hot topic, and we discussed closure of boat ramps um, after the closure of the beaches the week before. So um, most of them, or I'm sorry, all of them were in favor because of the congregating that occurred on the islands, um, the barriers, Beer Can, Greer Island, as well as Jewfish, um, they did not want to see that, and that was the uh, that was the the advice and and um, 
concerns of the policy group, and, and um, everyone was in favor of closing the boat ramps because of that. Jake, this is Mickey. Um, I think your records should reflect that the boat ramp closure, closure occurred on March 24 and not March 26, if you'll double check that. The, uh, I can help, a, I can help clarify that. It was the 24th decision. The effective date of the closure was 6 a.m. on Thursday, March 26th. There you go. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, um, I would just ask, Jake, can you just update them on where the policy group is on the issue today as of the last discussion? The, we discussed it Wednesday's policy, at Wednesday's policy group. They were um, all still in favor of keeping the beaches closed as well as the boat ramps. Okay. Uh, that's a long explanation. Hopefully you all got every bit of that. Um, Commissioner Servia. Okay. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the explanation, although I'm still not clearly understanding some of it, Bill, so I may ask you some additional questions. Um, since it is such a convoluted way to come to your conclusion, which I greatly respect, Bill, why do you think the governor's office hasn't clarified that for the state by saying what he means so that we don't have to go through this long path uh, to make a judgment. Well, quite honestly, I would rather not speculate as to, I, I do, I'd rather not try to answer that. Um, okay. I don't know. Okay. And have you called the governor's office, Bill, to make sure that they agree with your interpretation? No, no, I'm not. But I have consulted with attorneys outside of the county, law enforcement attorneys, and they do. Okay. And what is DEP's involvement, Bill? Um, do they have any authority? Not to my knowledge, no. Not in, okay. this, in this emergency, no. So the questions that I'm hearing uh, very often are why is Manatee County interpreting the ordinance or the, the order in this way so strictly? when all of the surrounding counties continue to leave their boat ramps open. Can you address that, Bill? Well, first I want to say the board made a decision to close its own boat ramps before the order was issued. That was a decision the board made as the owner and operator of those ramps. So I'm not sure that it's, it's accurate to characterize that decision as an interpretation of an order that had not yet been issued. The board made that decision as a practical matter, is my understanding. I wasn't involved in it. I heard it when I was listening to the board meeting. But it, I don't think it's accurate to say that it was a result of the governor's order because it predated that order. Yes. And did the board make that decision or did the executive committee uh, led by the public safety director come to that conclusion? I honestly don't remember. That, my recollection is that was a board, a board discussion and a, and a board action. Well, I, I, don't think that, I don't think that's true. I think it came from the policy board that we would be closing the boat ramp. Sherry, can you confirm that? I'm, I'm attempting to do that right now. Thank you. So um, I, I do recall, am I, is, is my feed, all right, I do recall a discussion at the board meeting about it. Maybe you all did not take action on it, but I'm quite certain the board discussed it. That's my recollection that the policy board brought forward, you know, a, a recommendation that the boat ramps would all be closed. It came before the board. There was no motion to not do that. That's okay. my recollection, but, you know, I don't, so, you know, things are so much going on. That's my recollection. Right. So Sherry is going to confirm that, but that's what I recall, that there was but, no motion to do something different. All right, and, and Madam Chair, as I said, I wasn't directly involved at that stage. This kind of came around to me later. Um, but regardless, it took place before the governor's executive order was issued. So, so going back to my, my answer to you, Commissioner Servia, I don't see that it was an interpretation of the governor's order because it predated that order. 
by at least a week. Okay, yes, I understand that. And it is my recollection that the board did not vote on that, that it did come forward from the committee. But that's why I asked because, you know, the days are flowing together pretty yeah. quickly. So, but now we as Manatee County are interpreting the, the uh, governor's order to say that all boat ramps should be closed through our county attorney's office. And so I want to ask you, uh, are you well, aware of uh, can I, can I stop you there? Because I think we need to be careful about that because we don't make the decision of whether or not to close them. It's not something the attorneys do. At the end of the day, as I said before, it's a law enforcement decision whether to close them down. But I do think that the executive order gives law enforcement the authority to do that on the grounds that it, they can treat them as non-essential except for the, those limited exceptions that are listed in the Miami order. Okay, but I don't want you. it to be mischaracterized as the county attorney's office is deciding what is opening or closed under this order. This Emergency Management Act clearly does not give that authority to the county attorney's office. Mm -hmm. That's not our role. Thank you for that. I, I can appreciate the, that, and I agree with you. I do have a question about enforcement. Um, it's my understanding that FWC and the Coast Guard are now enforcing the governor's order, and they're interpreting it a little differently from the people I hear from. They are um, enforcing the order that requires separation and no more than 10 people, but allows recreational boating. So I'd like to ask the sheriff, is the sheriff the right person to ask? Are you still charged with enforcing um, any of this on the water or just at the boat ramp? No, we on the water. So just some background. When the policy group first spoke about this, the issues that we were having were at Jewfish, Maritain Island, and also Passage Key, right? So all of those barriers were overcrowded, as they always are during normal time, and we were not able to control that. And I, I think it's important for me to let you know that that has not changed. That we still have that same problem now uh, that we did, you know, three weeks ago. But we are out there, I have both of my boats on the water every weekend, trying to keep people safe and keep them at proper social distancing guidelines and no more than 10 per boat. So we're on the water trying to enforce the CDC guidelines, not the boat ramp. Okay, um, so I have some additional questions. Um, is it possible that we could install signs or, or FWC or the Coast Guard could install signs on these islands and sandbars to say, you're not allowed during this emergency to be here? Would that help? I know that, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Chair, the, the, the county has done some of that, I believe, at beer camp. Or they, uh, am I right, Sheriff? Yes, Sheriff. We have made some signs and we uh -huh. have um, placed signs out. Those signs, I believe, been in place for three weeks. Um, and let me clarify um, that the um, public safety director, as in charge under the local state of emergency, um, made the recommendation to close the beaches and the boat ramps. That was prior to just prior to the March 24th meeting, and then put in place then again at 6 a.m. on March 26th, as part of his charge. Okay, Bill. Um, I, I I do have to just raise the concern that FWC runs the Florida Marine Patrol, the U.S. Coast Guard obviously patrols navigable waters. I'm not sure either one of them would would agree that they have jurisdiction past the wet sandy beach to do anything up a boat ramp or up on a key. I think they would probably take the position that they regulate boating activity on the water. And that's why I don't think it's realistic to expect to see FWC enforcing rules in an order that deal with business services that are happening on land because they view themselves as policing the water and the boating activity that's on the water, 
And the, the other executive order to which you alluded, Commissioner Servia, was, was it put in place at their request so that they could have some ability. But I think they're going to stop at the wet sandy beach, quite honestly. I think they have to under, under state law. I'm not certain of that, but I think their jurisdiction is pretty limited. Right. And, Sherry, you can clarify that at the boat ramps themselves, the county installed barriers, and I believe that we have somebody at Coquina South that's checking to make sure that it is only people with a, the license that was referenced, the um, saltwater license, as well as somebody is, at, I know somebody I think from the uh, police department in the city of Palmetto is at the Palmetto boat ramp. I, I don't know uh, to make sure that people can, um, th with the proper credentials, can get into those boat ramps, but I don't think there's any other policing going on at boat ramps, but maybe you could clarify. Correct. The public boat ramps, um, this, this issue pertains to the public boat ramps. We made the ability for our code enforcement officers as well as uh, Joe Westerman, who's in charge of our beach patrol. They're man they are manning the Coquina South Beach, excuse me, ramp and persons come to the ramp, they present their credentials. If they're able to access the water, they're granted access. There are some people that have come that are maintenance crews that are fixing boats, um, and they may also be granted access and be removed. But we have referred everyone to Joe Westerman, who is our beach patrol uh, division man uh, manager under the Public Safety Department over in Palmetto at the ramp at um, river, the Riverside there. They are open as well for certain hours. We are assisting the city of Palmetto who is managing that boat ramp for the same type of access. Okay, Misty, does that answer your question? Uh, sorry, I just have a couple more. I just wanna say this. Look, I, I have the greatest amount of respect for Bill Clegg and our sheriff. And I wanna do everything to support the public's health. But I also am realizing that unemployment is a public health concern. And there are poorest people are having problems getting out on the water to fish and get food for their family. And that's a, a real concern that I have. You know, I spoke to a YMCA leader um, who's now furloughed <laughs> and no longer working, who wants to take his boat out on the water and fish for the families that he used to serve at the YMCA because they don't have enough food. But he can't do that because of the boat ramp restriction. I, I hear about boaters going to Sarasota and to St. Pete to launch their boats. So they're still getting out on the water, but you know what? They're buying bait and gas and all the things that run our public, our, our local uh, private businesses in other counties now instead of our county, and they're going out in the water. And then they're, they're circulating amongst the same people they would anyway if they took their boat out through Manatee's boat ramp, but they're out of the county, and then they're bringing back whatever viruses they may you know, they may find themselves uh, having because they've been around other people, they're bringing them back to Manatee County anyway. So I, I'm just trying to understand, is there, are we protecting the public's health by closing the boat ramps or are we creating a bigger problem? All the tolls are waived, remember that. People can cross over the Skyway Bridge without uh, paying a toll and they're doing that. They're flooding the St. Pete boat ramp. So I know Martin County just recently reopened their public boat ramp. Again, I'm trying to make the best decisions for our public and, you know, tell me why, give me a compelling reason why we need to keep them closed. Or can we go seven days and give it a try to give people access to the water? Well, Bill, I know you wanted to talk, but I wanted I to do. talk uh, also as the, uh, is the board member sits on the policy board. The um, island folks are all unanimously in support 
of the closure of the boat ramps because they see the congregation of boaters off the beaches. They see the congregation of groups still at beer cans, still, still at uh, passage keys, still, I've seen them in the passes myself. It's been a while. Maybe things are getting better. I would love to relax this. You know, people, you know, I know people that love to go out on their boats and they can do it because they don't have to put it in the water. You know, this is, it, it is unfair, um, but uh, I have to, I feel because I have heard from all the policy group that they want to continue to support that, I would not, I could not change that as being the representative, I think, on that policy board at listening to those folks say that. But um, Bill, I'll go ahead and defer to you now. Well, I just I want to make it clear, Commissioner Servia, I'm I'm not advocating that you have to keep them closed. That isn't what I should be doing here as, as an attorney for the board. It's my job to tell you what the orders say. If I could have written them, they would be written differently, believe me. And I have my own concerns about marinas because that's where people pump out holding tanks. That's where they, they get their fuel. It supports navigation. Navigation is going to continue. But the governor did it that way, and in some parts of the state, they are enforcing it very strictly. In South Florida, it's my understanding that everything is, is closed. But, of course, those counties are a hot spot for coronavirus. And then when you just look online, and it sounds like you've done some of that yourself, you see in some counties they're closing things and others they are not. So clearly around the state, there's been a, you know, a difference in terms of how they're approaching it and how strictly they're following the governor's order. Could Manatee County do that as well? Yes, you can. But as I said at the conclusion of my discussion, I do think you should, you should take into consideration the concerns of the policy group because they're, they're dealing with the actual risks out in the field every day. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying what the outcome ought to be. You okay. have to make that decision. You're the client. Okay, good. I'm going to let some other commissioners talk. Commissioner Trace. Um. I'm going to have to disagree with the policy group on this one. We did not vote on this the way I recommend it. They closed the beaches, and uh, Sherry had kind of communicated with us what they were going to do, and by the time we met, it was already a done deal. Uh, I have talked to Sherry about this one every week since it has happened. I totally agree. If we could keep every boat off the water, that would be one thing, but there's too many boats on the water. I also have, know a lot of people, when you could not get meat at Publix, which we all know, when they were saying they would have gone out and caught enough fish to take care of their neighbors, their family, and everybody. Um, I've had, uh, I've not liked this one the whole time. I understand the people on Beer Can Island. They are just, maybe not just as many there, but every weekend since we have closed the boat ramp, they have had to chase them off of Beer Can Island, Passage Key, um, and a couple of the other keys. So actually, I want to make a motion that we reopen the boat ramps. Misty, go ahead. You got it. You you could speak, Misty. Uh, second. Okay. Uh, Sherry, you want to make a comment? Then I'm going to go to Commissioner Whitmore. I I do have a li I just would like the board to know I have a list of the current boat ramp closures across the state provided from Joe Westerman, who's the president of the Beach Patrol Association, and it's only if the board would like to know who where they are. That's all. Commissioner Whitmore is shaking her head that she would like to know. So if you could read that list. Yes, yeah, so just bear with me. Um, Vir Virginia, Key Beach, North Point Park, City of Miami closed. Uh, Sarasota City, two boat ramps. However, that may ha I do not have updated information on those today. Hollandale Beach, boat ramp closed. Boca Raton, Ocean Rescue. The City of Boca Raton, boat ramps are closed. City of Flagler Beach, boat ramps closed. City of Clearwater, they are open. They do have some restrictions in place for boaters. Hollywood Beach, boat ramps are closed. Jacksonville Beach, boat ramps are open with warnings. Martin County Ocean Rescue, the boat ramps were closed. 
pending some openings. Lake Worth Beach Ocean Rescue boat ramps closed. Boynton Beach boat ramps closed. Of course, Palm Beach County boat ramps closed. Miami Beach, My, Miami Dade County boat ramps closed. And Volusia County Upland Municipality boat ramps closed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, you wanted to say something, I'll go to Carol. John? I didn't. Uh, Commissioner Ball wanted to speak when, when the time was right. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore, and then I'll go to Commissioner Ball. This week before. Sorry, go ahead, Commissioner Whitmore. Okay, the last week before uh, public safety decided to close the boat ramps, uh, Kingfish Boat Ramp was parked. They, I had complaints. I've never seen, I've lived there 51 years. I've never seen so much parking on both sides, state right away, et cetera. So um, if you vote for this, and if you want, I don't really care. I'm not going to, but if you do, Every mayor on Anamaria Island supports keeping it closed. The mayor of Holmes Beach just passed an order, and I copied all you commissioners. She closed every street parking in her entire city. So the beach may be open, but there's no access to get to it because we still have issues out there with people going around. So as of yesterday, it, or it starts today, you can't park on any street in Holmes Beach. There's no street parking on public right of way. Trinity Beach back. Every city mayor that has the majority of the traffic to the boat ramps doesn't support this. I've gotten it just as much as you have, trust me, and I understand that. But we did leave it. We let the people try it, and that's why we were where we were, because they aren't complying. So um, you're, if we vote... If we change this, you're voting in disrespect of the mayors that actually voted to keep them closed. And I guess you said Wednesday they still discussed it at the policy meeting? We, we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and was there any mayors in the city, in the whole entire county that were at that meeting that supported opening any boat wraps, including Palmetto? No, Palmetto, everyone, I went down one by one because I know how as, I'm the only one on the policy committee, I believe me, I'm getting emails who are the policy committee? What exactly did they say? I have forwarded out all of the responses that Sherry's given to try to make it clear to people. You all get them. I figure the public can get them as well. Who said what? What was discussed? None of this is being done in a vacuum, guys. You are all getting reports. You all should know what's being said at these meetings. I have no problem stating exactly, and that's why I said, Carol, that if if this comes back before a vote, I didn't know it was going to come back before us, that I have to vote representing that policy board. I believe that is my position because I've heard from all those mayors. Uh, maybe if I wasn't an at-large commissioner, but you, I, I, I wish we could open all the boat ramps. Mm -hmm. I hope it would, I have a feeling this may pass, and I hope if it does pass that people will comply with the FWC regulations. And I hope we have enough people on the FWC, because I know the sheriff isn't gonna be able to, um, he already stated that he doesn't have enough resources to make this happen, <laughs> to make sure that these people are not congregating. But I've seen them congregate, I've seen them congregate on the beach, but maybe maybe it's maybe it's a different time. So maybe. I'm gonna- uh, I'm not done. I'm sorry, I'm not done. Yeah. Before, um, and, and if this does pass, I want to ask the professional opinion of the sheriff. And I want to make sure that immediately it goes out to all the cities on who voted for this, because they were adamant about this. And I think um, that's why I've asked for these meetings every week, because of these hard decisions that we have to make. But I have not heard one um, a mayor of any city support opening the boat ramps right now. This is a public safety issue. That's the only reason why they're closed. <laughs> so we passed a we passed to continue the curfew, but we're going to open the boat ramps and let everybody party over the weekend. So, or go out to Bird Key and and have a good time. So I know the sheriff just stepped away, but I want the sheriff to make a comment about this because 
the city leaders are going to have to put up this because this is in, a lot of the boat ramps are located in the city. Okay, I'm going to go to Commissioner Ball then to Sheriff Wells to make a comment, and also um, Jake. I think is I think he's pushing his button. It's hard to tell. So Commissioner Ball, go ahead. Uh, that's all right. I'd rather hear from the sheriff first. Okay, Sheriff, you'd like to make a comment, please, on opening the boat ramps, which is the motion, and then we'll go to Ball and then Johnson. So obviously, you know, we we work at the mercy of this board, but we're going to enforce whatever um, you enact. So. We would, it, it's a public place, so we would have to make sure that when they are there, that they are abiding by the CDC guidelines. Okay. And if we got a complaint, and you know, this all began because a lot of comm commissioners were complaining to law enforcement about the complaints they were getting from citizens. So we're gonna, we're gonna do what's necessary, whatever we can to make sure that when the, if, if you open them back up, that they are following CDC guidelines to the best of our ability. Okay. Uh, Commissioner um, Baugh, did you want to speak now? Yes, ma'am, please. Okay. I think I'm good, yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to hear what the sheriff says because, you know, I've had some conversation with him and he's got a tough job, he and his deputies do, <laughs> just like EMS and, and others and the firefighters. Um, but I do think in this case, you know, I, I would vote to reopen uh, the boat ramps and the thing of it is, is that then it's up to the people to show that they're responsible enough to do what they need to do. I don't buy that the residents in Manatee, all of them wouldn't do that. I think the lo a lot of them would. I think the majority would because they know if they don't, we'll shut them back down. Uh, the board did not vote initially to do this. Jake uh, said they were closing them, I think, at 3 o'clock that afternoon, as I recall. So something like that. But um, the bottom line is I'd like to give you know, the citizens an opportunity. I, I want to ask the board, do you think, I, I think in Pinellas, um, Pinellas opened, has their boat ramps open, but it's only for residents of Pinellas. Should we try something along that line? Might that help? That's a question to the board. Or to the sheriff. The sheriff, I think he's going to talk about all yeah. that might be to enforce. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Commissioner. I, I, I think that would be a valid point if it could be enforced. It cannot. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the issues that we have had is that other counties' boat ramps are open, and, and therefore people are still making it. They're still coming. That's key. And so, but it would be very difficult for us to sit there and check someone's driver's license. You know, if there's a call about people gathering, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get there. But I. I It'd be difficult for me to for me to enforce that for you. Right. It was just I was just curious as to whether or not that might work. All right, thanks, Sheriff. Thank you. I think that is a question we've all received. Commissioner Johnson. I'll take it. It's just Nancy oh, County. There we go. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, start again, please. Okay. Um, I just said that answered. Sheriff answered my question so that we could police just Nancy County residents. Um, so at this point, I'd just like to call the question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Motion, call the question. Do we have a second? Okay, please, Commissioner Trace? Second. All right. All those in favor of calling the question, uh, raise your hand. Can I see a hand vote? I think I can do a hand vote, right? All right. All right, the question is called and passed. We have a motion. Everyone but Commissioner Serbia. Serbia, right. Commissioner okay, Serbia. Thank you. I'm sorry, clarifying that motion okay. passed six to one. Commissioner Serbia voted against the motion to call the question. Thank you. All right. So the question can I have the motion again repeated just so we all know exactly what we're voting on? Yes, the motion was to reopen the boat ramp. All right. We have a motion by okay. Commissioner uh, Serbia. Can we do one by one? I'm sorry, who is the motion by? Trace. It's by Commissioner Trace. Trace. I'd like to say uh, that's to open no, the county. No, no. Oh, open the county boat ramps. Open system. the county boat ramps. Okay, okay, that was not specified in the motion. So we'll add that in. All right, the motioner clarifies the motion. Who made the second? Was it um, Commissioner Servia? Commissioner Servia, agree with the clarification on the second to, to clarify it to open the county boat ramps? Yes, I agree with that, but I also no talking. Put, no, no talking. question. No more okay. discussion. 
All right, the motion is clarified. All those in favor, uh, I'll, I'll go a, a voice vote. Commissioner Whitmore? No. Commissioner Servia? Yes. Commissioner Trace? Yes. Commissioner Bellamy? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Wait, your vote, you're voting to keep the boat ramps closed? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So you voted no. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Baugh? Yes. Okay. Yes. Commissioner uh, Banak votes no. So I'm sorry, I didn't count the votes. I should have. Do, hey, do you know? Three to four. Four to three. Four to three. Four to three, the motion passed. Three. Motion okay. carried. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, if, if I might, ju just for the viewing public, uh, Mr. Sauer, as your public uh, safety uh, director, had HAD, had and has the authority to close the boat ramps under the emergency resolution. So I just didn't want, I, I didn't want there to be any doubt out there about Jake's authority to close the boat ramps. He absolutely had the authority, but now he has been overruled by the Board of County Commissioners, which of course is your prerogative at the end of the day. Okay, well, glad I voted the way I did. Um, all right, uh, there is a question that I've had. When does the boat ramp reopening, when would that take place? I, I think we have to give our staff time to do this. Uh, Sherry, I'll go ahead and yes, refer to you. We would have, we would have to have time to, we have, we, it is Friday afternoon. We will have to mobilize. Uh, we will not have the boat ramps over and open until Sunday. Sunday. Everyone's off Easter Sunday. Okay. Commissioner, uh, 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 Mr. Clegg. Um, Madam Chair, I wanted to revisit for a minute the idea of opening the ramps for residents only. Um, given the circumstances we're in with the governor's order, I would be comfortable from a legal standpoint if the board wanted to limit the use of the ramps that way. I do understand that the sheriff's facility resources to enforce that, he probably doesn't have the resources to stand there and police the use of boat ramps. But those are the county's facilities so that is something that the county's own staff could do if you chose to do that. In other words, you could have your own code enforcement people on site or your own parks people on site. And if you put notice out to the public that that's what you're doing and you put signage up, then I, I would be comfortable from a legal standpoint. You could do that the same way that other counties are doing that in this emergency. I just want the board to be to recognize it is an option if it's something you want to do. Hey, I would defer to Sherry for her comments about how we could do that. Maybe it's maybe it's something to think about. I do not. I we do not have enough people to man every boat, every one of our public right boat ramps to manage. We have the same issue the sheriff has about having power and control over checking people's. Uh, driver's license, I could not guarantee that we could um, ensure that. All right. Uh, everybody's pushed their buttons, I guess. Um. <laughs> Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased with the vote, uh, but one thing that I want to say very strongly to the public is this is not the opportunity to stop social distancing. Um, please, we are not, I, I'm afraid of sending the wrong message that things are not getting better. We are in an emergency and you must practice that social distancing and, and park your trailers appropriately and follow the rules or I'm sure that this board is gonna revisit this issue quickly. So please, everyone, follow the rules and do the right thing. Don't go to the beaches. Don't go to the islands. Do the right thing. Hmm. Commissioner Whitmore. The well, role? the mayor of Holmes Beach, where, um, where um, Kingfish is, the streets have been um, 
You're not allowed to park on any of the streets. So I don't know how in heck these people are going to park at the boat ramp, except for those few places we have. I think that's a total joke. But um, four to three, I lost. Uh, I do want us to revisit this again next Friday and also the curfew. And I still have to ask the question that I was waiting um, be uh, before the two on the agenda we had to vote. I'd like somebody from the health department to respond and why cannot the health care providers, I work at Florida Home Health, we're not allowed to know which facilities, assisted living or skilled nursing, where there's positive patients when we have to go in and see those patients. So, um, and I know people know where they are, where the hotspots are in their county. I did hear there was a bunch of transfers to the local hospitals of some of these patients. So, um, in all fairness to healthcare providers that are out there in the field, we would like to know so if the health department could um, respond. I know that they know we've seen on, on Jacksonville, they have a hotspot of a nursing home. We've seen it in Washington. I know we have this issue in Manatee County. So in all fairness to all the caregivers, um, that when patients are being transferred out of nursing homes or we go in nursing homes or assisted living, we need to know, we don't need to know the patient or what room they are. And we just need to know, you know, what kind of protective gear to wear in there will begin there instead of getting the whole outfit. But again, I want to make sure we bring this up again next Friday because I have a feeling, unfortunately, from what's happened in the past, that we will be closing the boat ramps again next week because we do have a lot of people that, and I feel, I'm sorry, Shara, you know, I know you'll do your job. I know people are going to do their job. But the only reason why we had to do this is because more or less everybody doesn't think it's a big deal. And we've heard that in the audience. Um, just so you know, I'm already getting text messages from the um, mayor. They're very upset. Um, so, but I guess that's okay. This is a free country. You can vote however you want. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bellamy. Yes, I was, um, I'm getting some text messages also. And I think um, some of the things that are going to have to be discussed, it's going to be difficult to um, close or reopen or reopen and close um, is what I'm getting um, from um, some individuals that are communicating um, with me. Again, I'm, I'm with Misty. We want to make sure social distancing is, is still out in, in, in front of us. And um, I, I'm concerned about that individual that needs to uh, go out and fish to feed their family. And, and, and that's the reason why, you know, I, I was in, in support of opening the boat ramps. I mean, I am concerned about the spread and things like that, but, I mean, I am very concerned about individuals that are, that are unemployed now, um, don't have access to be able to fish and find ways to feed their families and things of that nature right there. We're in rough times, tough decisions. Um, I just wanted to be clear why I am the way I am. I, I want that family to have the ability to be able to have access to go fish and feed the family. So I'm with Misty on that one. Thank you. Commissioner Trace? can't get them open tomorrow, which I don't think we can uh, since it's Easter. I do not want a county employee to have to go out and work on Sunday, so I'm fine with them opening Monday. And that also gives the uh, sheriff and everybody, you know, although there's plenty of boats on the water, so to blame the fisherman who uses the boat ramp a lot is, is not fair. So I personally am happy with it. it with uh, I don't know if we need to make a motion or, or we can just all nod our heads to say that Monday is sufficient so our crew does not have to, so our people do not have to work on Easter. Let's sure. make a motion happen. Sherry? Sherry? Yes. You need her? Okay. Yes. I want to I want to please ask for a couple clarifications. So again, I want to make sure everybody understands we're just talking about the Manatee County operated boat ramps. Is that correct, Chairman Benack? That's correct. The motion was clarified to include the Manatee County boat ramps, correct? Um I believe if we were to, I believe we would need to have a later time on Monday. We would we would have to announce a time on Monday because in order to go out and open all of the ramps that we have, it will take a mobilization. And to avoid tomorrow, it would probably be Monday, late Monday. So we will have to get you a time as long as... This board is allowing me to establish a time and make an announcement to you that it would be sometime on Monday. Okay. I have, I'm no, gonna, pro I have no problem with that, but I do have one other question. How about the two boat ramps that are open uh, with the uh, uh, police or uh, code or whatever? You know, I think it's uh, Coquina South and Regatta Point at Palmetto. What happens to those? Do they 
or remain with uh, personnel in front of them over the weekend, or would you just open them since there's nothing in front of them? If, if this board is directing us to open the boat ramps on Monday, then they would still maintain the current status that they are through the weekend, and then they would be open on Monday, and we will not be providing any uh, resources as we are today to any of our boat ramps, effective the opening times on Monday. I personally think that is the way to do it. Uh, once again, I don't want our crew out there working on Easter to make this motion. I can't see where it matters whether they open Monday or Sunday and push our crew. That's my opinion. Okay, so I, I do have a question. The, so the boat ramp that is in, uh, in Palmetto, is that a Manatee County boat ramp or is that a Palmetto boat ramp? We, we are currently coordinating with the city of Palmetto for that boat ramp. So we would continue to help them man that boat ramp through the weekend. And then it would be, we would take direction from them as to what their status would be after, after this vote. Okay, because our motion did not affect that boat ramp, correct? Uh, I've heard from Shirley and she says she will uh, be consistent with the county. So when the county opens on Monday, that boat ramp would open. I've heard from Mayor Bryant. Okay, well, um, all right. Uh, Reggie, you were raising your hand, I think, were you? I don't know. You were, okay, you're good. Commissioner Baugh, I've heard, wants to speak. No. Oh, okay. All righty. Uh, that is everyone who wants to speak. So we're clear, no one has any opposition. To the boat ramps not opening until Monday, they'll be um, so right now status quo until a Monday effective date for this motion. Uh, do I need a clarification motion for that, Bill? I just want to make sure we're doing this because I need to be reckoned. I, I do not think so. But uh, Sherry, are you comfortable? You you know where to go with it? Yes, sir. I'm comfortable. All right. Then no, I do not think another motion is necessary. All right. Um, just want to ask Jake. I, we didn't even get a chance to let you speak. Jake, did you have anything more you want to add? Um, let me, no, not really, I guess. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Sherry, anything before we close the meeting? I've got something, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Uh, this is back to the uh, curfew resolution. Uh, I know that all of the commissioners uh, were privy to uh, the ACLU letter uh, dated April 7th, uh, and they sent me a follow-up email as well that they asked to be entered into the record today, and so I will simply provide a copy of the ACLU letter of April 7, along with a follow-up email to the clerk uh, as expeditiously as possible at the first of the week. Uh, but, but I did want to read for the record uh, a follow yet another follow-up email from the ACLU uh, that came, uh, came across on my email at 12.50 today. So that was 10 minutes before you kicked off this 1 o'clock meeting. Uh, it is from a uh, Michael Barfield, President, American Civil Liberties Union of Florida. Hi, Mickey. I read Resolution 20-056, the proposed revision to 20053. Assuming it passes, I think this addresses the key concerns of the ACLU. Hopefully, we can look at the remaining issues and perhaps seek clarification from the governor on an amended executive order to address same. So, uh, so here we have the president of the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida expressing considerable satisfaction with the resolution that was passed today. So I just wanted to uh, recite that for the record. Okay, Commissioner Whitmore, you want to make a comment? Uh, I just have a question. So uh, are we all in agreement next Friday we'll revisit the curfew and the boat ramp thing, correct? And also, what about, uh, what about Bill's interpretation? Uh, somebody mentioned, oh, now we're going to put people and they can get gas at marinas. Well, those are all private marinas. So are they closed now? According to the governor's direction, they're not supposed to be open, right, Bill? Carol, I just want to say that this board took action on our marina. I don't, you know, we don't have marinas. Wants, oh, right. Yes, we do. I mean, excuse Where? me. Where? Boat ramps. Excuse yeah. me. Boat ramps. Boat ramps. If somebody wants to challenge the opening of a marina, it isn't up to our county attorney to interpret that. You know, they can challenge that. If they did. I want to hear from the attorney because he just did. 
I mean, he's told us what the governor gonna, has said. I'm going to say as my position as a county commissioner, it isn't up to me to interpret the governor's order relative to a private marina. It's confusing, is what I heard from uh, Attorney Clegg, that it would I, take clarification. I read it. It's written in black and white. It's not confusing. It's just you had to find it. I have right, it. No, I'll go ahead and let you speak, and then we're going to... Yeah, amendment yeah. three. It's all right. It's my job. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that... First of all, I, we're not interpreting, with all due respect, Commissioner Whitmore. You. We're just telling you what it says. Right. And and there is a consensus among the lawyers I've talked to about it. I haven't I haven't called the governor's office or his counsel, but that it it allows for those uses to be treated as non-essential, at least as far as recreational stuff. But it's very clear that around the state, you're not seeing that being enforced that strictly in most places. It's mainly in South Florida where you're seeing a more strict enforcement of that. At the end of the day, I think it's up to law enforcement. If they see a problem, you know, if they see 200 people having a fishing tournament on a seawall, and that, that's a real thing. It happens all the time at my marina. They have the ability to go in and close that down. But it's really up to the individual property owner or operator to make that decision first. I don't think we should treat this like we do code enforcement issues where we're going to walk around and start closing this or leaving that open. There are so many different uses listed in on that list online that it's very, very hard to do that from an enforcement standpoint. So that's the best and most practical answer I can give you. Okay. That's the last person that I have signed up, unless Sherry or Mickey or John, you have any... Oh, Commissioner Ball wants to speak. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if it was possible that we could go ahead, uh, you know, I think Commissioner Whitmore wanted us to meet next Friday again, and we have the curfew anyway. So can we set up the time now for next Friday so everyone knows ahead of time? Do, do we still do it at 1 o'clock, or can we do it at Can we do it at 2 o'clock? I, I actually um, have to be somewhere early Friday morning. Um, that I cannot get out of, um, so it's, it's medically related. So one o'clock, at, at, I would prefer two o'clock, but um, if you guys can't make it at uh, two o'clock, then I'll see if I can make it back by one o'clock for what I have to do family related next weekend in the morning, Friday, excuse me. Commissioner Whitmore. I can't, sorry, I couldn't find my, sorry, I don't have my glasses on. I kind of, I'm at my this other job, and I really have to be home. Um, I should have been home a little while ago, but um, one o'clock, and then Betsy, when you come, you take over the meeting. Okay. Uh, okay, that's fine. Oh God. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I heard that. All right, Sherry. It's on ready. you, please. Sorry. <laughs> Meet yes, everybody. We can. <laughs> <laughs> We can schedule the meeting at 2 o'clock. It'll be 2 o'clock on Friday. We will coordinate um, similar uh, arrangement as today. Okay. I was okay with 1 o'clock if Carol had to start oh, it. I I'm couldn't. sorry, 1 o'clock, whatever. I, you well, guys correct me. You want, is it 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock? Carol asked for 1 o'clock. I asked for 2 o'clock. She wants to start the meeting at 1 o'clock. That's fine. I, can, I, I will get in as quick as I can. I have something that I have to do with. All right. All right. We will schedule it at 1 o'clock if that's the pleasure of the board. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'll just say everybody have a safe weekend. Remember, it's not time to change your procedure. That's the only thing that's made the difference. I listened to Dr. Burke. She said it's the only thing that's made a difference. She's amazed that Americans can follow these uh, regulations and rules. I got a kick out of that. But she said, don't make me mad. <laughs> the only thing that's made a difference is the social distance. Everybody have a very safe and uh, small group gathering Easter weekend. Um, so uh, be safe, everybody out there. And with no further comments, we are adjourned. Thank you. Nicely handled, John. Good job. It was a lot of yeah, work. Very good.
Hello, I'm Priscilla Wisnett Trace, your Manatee County Commissioner.